Hello and welcome to, and that's why we drink the podcast with Em and Christine, your I, badass ghost hunters. That's ooh, Em. That's me. I have no pants on today. You tell welcome. me them who I am. Oh, and that's Christine. She has pants on today, I think. How do you know? I think. I cannot be sure. Oh, well, speaking of no pants, I have things to say about that real quick. I'm sure you do. Um, One of our friends, Lizzie, I never got to, I didn't show you because I wanted to show you on camera, <clears throat> sent me a Christmas gift. Aw. And it's from... Uh, it has to do with the episode. I think it was like 191 where you gave me my own like Mexican wrestling name. Yes, yes, of course. <clears throat> so I now own a hat <gasps> that says El Burrito Sin Pantalones, which is the pantsless burrito. Holy crap. And it makes me so happy. Wait, but I that's wanted to... so cute. Is that not the nicest? Sin Pantalones. People love that. That anyway beautiful. what was I, eva the red the red-headed devil or something <laughs> that checks out um, anyway i wanted i you just i well i mentioned i'm not wearing pants and in the spirit of that i wanted to let you know my hat also lets everyone know i'm not wearing pants so oh i love it i um for once am wearing pants because once the camera is on me i feel like maybe i owe that much uh to the people who are watching not me um, not you no i would never nah. on your behalf um but no, no, anyway no. m what are you drinking today and why? Um, that's a great question. What I was not prepared to answer. Um, I am drinking water out of my, uh, again, my Regina Pizzeria cup because I'm trying to stay hydrated. Lovely. Um, why do I drink? Well, hmm, a few things now that you've opened the floodgates. Um, first of all, I drank because I apologize in advance that my audio is very echoey next week it will not be like that because i am ordering a nice little soundproof situation for myself now that well i'm sending you a plunger though i thought we were gonna put a plunger for it maybe i'll get like an honorary plunger and just have it next to me that'll be my decor yes i love that um the other reason i drink is uh because my adhd meds are not working like i thought they would yeah i'm super bummed and like it's gotten to a point where the uh my psychiatrist has been like we've kind of hit the max dosage oh, no so like i now I'm, I'm probably gonna have to start back at square one or maybe it hasn't kicked in right away and he's like you can do it for another two weeks or so and we'll see if things change but if not then uh, i don't know enough about psychiatry but they were saying something about i'm gonna have to add a salt to it which apparently makes it like more problematic because it's like more addictive or something a salt or like salt <clears throat> Like, apparently it's called a salt. Oh, I thought you were saying like assault with a deadly weapon. <laughs> They're going to assault me with some salt, apparently. <laughs> okay, and got it. <laughs> I don't know why I can't just get some fucking Adderall. Like, I don't know why I got to be trying all this stuff I was never prepared for. So like, I'm, I'm hoping that I can just ask him, like, why didn't you just start me on like the most common thing? But Because it's controlled medication. They're going to give you a hard time about it because people abuse it. It's, listen, it's the same with the clonopin. You get a really hard time anytime you go to a new psychiatrist. If anything, though, for the last 28 years, like I've, I've been my own issue. Like yeah. I would rather just try one, like try an issue that like could become a non-issue and that like, it'll help me from myself. You know what I mean? Well, hopefully that's what happens because when I, sw- I had a psychiatrist who was like, I know you and I trust you and I don't think you're abusing this. But then when I moved and got a new psychiatrist, they were like, well, how am I supposed to know that you're not abusing this medication? And it's like, you have to start all over the process of like convincing them that you're not gonna, you know, abuse yeah. it. Anyway, that's probably why I why I drink in a bad way, but I do drink in a good way in that Allison is home after six Yay! weeks. So there's that. Why do you drink and what do you drink? Guess what I'm drinking a London fog. <gasps> <laughs> I know. Blaze is like, I'm running to the coffee shop down the street to grab like uh, coffee beans. Uh, do you want anything? And I was like, I want a London fog because Em and I are recording today. And they had that's one so and it's nice. really good, Em. And they sweetened it without asking. It's very Ugh. good. If you work at Starbucks, you know, well, not like every Starbucks employee across you the globe. You know about me, Em. Me specifically. But I have complained a lot openly that Starbucks who like is supposed to know the recipe half the time it's never right because it just apparently it's like a rare thing to ask for or it's not asked enough yeah weird 
and they always forget to sweeten it. And I always complain specifically to you about that. So I'm glad that they sweetened it for you. Yeah, automatically. And it's really good. So I'm trying to come up with new ways for you to visit me. Um, and oh, here comes Moon. Oh my God, knocking all of my shit over. Okay. Here Two he ways to lure me in a little kitty cat and my favorite tea. Exactly. I'm trying my best here. Come here, Moon. Say hello. Oh, kitty. He's, ah. he's what he... people call a void cat because he's all black. So it's really hard to see in like photos, his face. <laughs> so he's he's keeping you sheltered he's saving your eyes from the beauty <laughs> that he is the cuteness um oh i have a reason why i drink which is really weirdly uh related to i'm talking really fast i think i had too much caffeine today but oh my god um i uh i it's really weirdly related to what you said which is that i realized yet i mean i don't want to like rain on your parade at all and i'm sorry if i do but i realized oh, yesterday as lady gaga says rain on me all right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever it takes. Did you know actually that is an original M. Schultz quote that was stolen by Gaga? You know, um, the, the gags, she loves to do that to me. She so. likes to borrow your favorite set. And I let her. I let her. You know? She actually has a new album coming out called Noodles All the Way to the Top. And I heard about that. And I texted her. I was like, I was like, Miss Gags, what are you doing? Come on. Don't don't be don't be foolish. Like you don't know. Sometimes Bear tells me, oh, you know, Bear, my dad, sometimes Bear tells me that he listens to the intro of these episodes and I'm like, oh God, oh God, what did I say? I don't remember. Can, can someone he, make, a, can someone make an album, by the way, or like an album artwork of Bear and the Gags? Like, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know who the hell Lady Gaga is, promise you. <clears throat> Um, but so sometimes he says that and I'm like, oh God, what did I say? And then he has this really disappointed look on his face and I'm like, <laughs> Maybe I should start thinking better about what I start the episodes with. And here I am. I'm not doing that. So sorry. Dad. My, my father would look the same way if he even tried to listen. So <laughs> yeah. like, you're, I don't know if you're luckier. I'm really lucky know. he doesn't listen actually. I, so. That's how I usually feel. And then he's like, I tried listening to another episode. It like pains him physically. You know what terrifies me? The uh, Bumble girl who I've been becoming friends with. Right. Uh, I'm always scared when I meet someone on Bumble and they don't know who I am, which is what I want. I want like a clean slate. Like I want like, you don't yeah. know me, but I, they'll creep on me because that's what you do when you like meet someone online, you sure. learn about them. And they're like, oh yeah, haha. I listened to a few of your episodes to like oh, get God. to know your vibe. And I was like, let me guess, you're breaking up with me. Yeah, I that's the worst. <laughs> it's I like, mean. you have to find a line of like, somebody knows you well enough to be like, oh, I understand, appreciate you. But like the other line of not knowing you at all, because then they're going to be scared. I've, I've made a few friends where they have said, uh, so I know that like you're known for this thing, but I hope you don't mind, but I'm not going to listen because I want to get to know you like wow like between you and me that's and i was kind. like i was like that's the nicest thing you could do like yeah <laughs> please, to like please not, god don't make an opinion of me don't judge me, in the me room. yeah it's terrible yeah i mean <laughs> sometimes i wonder that because i'm like and if you listen to beach you sandy too i'm like talking about my here it is my dilbert m m machine all the time and i'm like if a new friend is like listening to the podcast <laughs> and just hears me bragging about my dilbert m m machine they're gonna be like this person Bragging. is unstable. Yes. Oh my God. Very okay. proud of this. That's a word you you did not use the first time you mentioned that. <laughs> I'm showing you my true colors, future BFFs. Well, um, um anyway. Wait, uh, can I tell you why I drink? Sorry, I got sidetracked. Oh my God, you didn't even say it. Something. Sorry. It's We're, the caffeine. Okay. okay, the reason I drink, because you said Lady Gaga something or other, rain on me, my parade, mm, whatever. Mm, so mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that um, I found out yesterday, I realized that the Lexapro is working. And I don't think I've ever had like an experience where it's just What does just that like, mean? You found out it's working. So I, I was prescribed it because I was on Wellbutrin and it like, uh, it's an antidepressant, but it like also is known to increase anxiety and um as oh. everybody knows i'm like a very anxious person oh. <laughs> so i never really put that together and i was like well i'd rather be anxious than depressed and so i just kept taking it and then my new psychiatrist was like oh well they actually work really well together and i was like okay so i started mm -hmm. taking the lexapro being like i don't know what this is gonna do if anything and all of a sudden, so it, I realized it like it hit me because yesterday I had this like little interview on a podcast, um, a true crime show that I, I, I'll let you guys know when it comes out. But um, I was like setting up for it. And usually I get like just terrible stomach pains and like I get so nervous to get on a Zoom call or a phone call. And poor Emma's is always like, we're literally talking to like 
our manager had calmed we're, down. Like it's we're, we're calling Eva. <laughs> we're calling Eva, literally. And can, you, like, can you relax? <laughs> I'll be like, I'm terrified. And I'm like, I have to change. This is embarrassing. I have to change shirts because I'm like sweating. I have to like use the bathroom 10 times. Like it's really it's bad. And yesterday I was sitting here and I was like preparing and the guy was running late and I just sat there. And all of a sudden the thing started ringing. And I was like, wait a second. I didn't even like. I wasn't like freaking out. I wasn't having to do breathing exercises. I was like a little nervous, but I was like, oh, this is what a normal person feels as far as like, oh God, I'm a little nervous for this, but not like my whole body is shutting down because I don't want to hop on the phone in a perfectly well, good. easy phone call. And I was just like, I think that must be what it's like. So I'm just very thankful. And a lot of people have written in saying Lexapro really did wonders for them too. So thank the Lord. How long did you have to be on it before? It's been like five weeks, I think. Okay. And so I finally was like, wait a second. So I don't know how long it's been like adjusting, but yesterday was the first time I had like something that would have absolutely made me like piss my pants. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's weird. I'm just a little nervous, but that's it. And so anyway, wow. I'm very thankful for it. And it's really changed. And I didn't have to take any clonopin, like, or, or propranolol. I was like, holy crap. So anyway, cheers. Wow. Good for you. Sorry. I know. I didn't want to like, ra again, rain on you, like Gaga says, but mm -hmm. um, wow. I was just very thankful that for once I was able to diminish my anxiety for once ever. Wow. Well, okay. Well, good for you. I'm very, ha I'm very happy for oh, you. Thank you. And a lot of people have written in saying like, Hey, I started, I went and sought help for my ADHD or I started antidepressants because you guys talked about it. And that just makes my, makes me so happy that people are, um, you know, opening up about that. Um, a lot of people have, uh, through Tea Time Tuesday, because I see everyone's gossip, whether or not I post it, That's I see true. it. And a lot of people have been saying that this is like their year to go figure out their mental Hell health situations. Yes. So very excited. For me, it's the year of sandwiches. For you, it's the year of mental health, whatever. <laughs> of antidepressants. It's, it's a wide range, but like Listen, that. new year, new president, new meds. It's new sandwiches. All Today is garbage day, as Eva oh, said earlier. It's garbage day. Happy trash day. <laughs> uh, no, today, literally like a couple hours ago, we got a new president also. Oh, and also, by the way, I know a lot of people were like, did anybody even, did they not even know? We were recording last week and we got off the recording and Eva said, hey, maybe you should look at your phones. And it was like, capital has been breached and people are mobbing the interior and we were like this yeah. has happened in the last two hours while we were recording like the simpsons blah 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 and then we get off and it's like hey the whole world has gone to shit so we didn't ignore it we just didn't know it was happening it was i mean we really could not have picked a less convenient time to... <laughs> it was so wild <laughs> like as we were as i was talking about the simpsons i was getting like a flood of texts from people being like check the news look your at the mom news, was watch calling the news. you yeah and i was like i'm recording like whatever tragedy has befallen the nation i will check later and <laughs> then I, and then i found out it really was a tragedy that had befallen the nation well, so. isn't there a weird thing that like the sim didn't the simpsons also predict that so they I'm pretty sure that was a Photoshop situation. Oh, okay. Cause that but would have been really weird. That when I last, before I like started looking into that, I believed it because I was like, so on St Simpson stuff. Right. Um, <clears throat> but when we found out about the Capitol, people were starting to tag me in this thing that basically said that like, oh, they also predicted that this would happen as I'm telling the story. All of the Simpsons predictions yeah. that another thing that I, that they could have predicted happened and so uh that was really weird but now I'm seeing that that was like fake and they were trying to free people out so uh, I'm not sure well anyway still weird. anyway thank you for drinking uh London Fog in celebration today. it makes me miss you like more than I thought I was just drinking and I, was like, <laughs> I only ever have these with M and so now I'm just like really sad I guess I need to go take more have you iced it because that's gonna really fucking rock your socks off no but it's like 25 degrees here today so okay that's right. I'm going to but I wanted to make sure they sweeten it properly first and crank they the heat and then pour that puppy over some ice cubes it's <laughs> okay. gonna change your world okay next Wednesday when the next government building is being swarmed I'll try that yes okay perfect uh no and especially thank you because postmates and starbucks are now no longer working together which means i had no idea until you posted that so i can't even get them anymore because That's they rough. they made a deal with uber eats but uber eats is menu is super limited so london fogs oh. aren't even available so if That's i want traumatic. one i have so to sorry. make one and it is talk about a tragedy that's befallen the nation so <laughs> um, i heard that actually on simpsons season four it was somebody they predict london fogs 
this is not the year for Venice. Canceled. It's the year for everything else, but not my London fogs. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yikes. Sorry, everybody. Welcome to and That's Why We Drink, where I don't wear pants and Christine drinks my favorite drink from across the country. Um, but is sweating a little less, so. And that's what a London fog is for, baby. There's the elf, that. The El Foggy all the way. Yikes. Christine, I don't know if you saw it, but in my new recent TikTok fame, uh, I've been catching up and apparently someone has made a TikTok about us talking about how much we love Third third it's, Love. It's really funny. It's like <laughs> M talking about my boobs because of Third Love. It's it's become very meta and layered, um, but it's true. We love Third Love. I love Third Love, especially because first of all, there's a Fit Finder quiz that you can take, which you know how much I love a quiz. Love and they're quiz. designed for a perfect fit. They have more than 80 sizes from cups AA to I, including half cups, which is like something I hadn't even heard of before. Um, and I actually just got a new bra with, I actually told everyone on Twitter, which like, I'm sure they didn't want to know, but I told them anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but I got a new, uh, bra and it's like, it's really pretty. Cause it's like kind of lacy, but it's also really comfortable, which I feel like has never been done. Like the I've never had a hybrid. Cute... Yeah. It's, hybrid. I feel like they either have to be really like meh and comfortable or like cute and really uncomfortable, but I found the perfect match. Third love knows a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering our listeners 20% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash drink now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash drink for 20% off today. Proceed. I can't see your feet, but I have a hunch that they are being <laughs> hugged warmly by some very beautiful Rothy's. So chic, so beautiful, so eco-friendly. Uh, Rothy's shoes are seamlessly knit with thread made from plastic water bottles, so they're ultra comfortable as soon as you slip them on, in that there's no break-in period, which is huge. Rothy's come in an ever-changing array of colors, prints, and patterns, and they're a and they're available in a range of styles too. I know, Christine, <laughs> you have uh, every pair under the sun. <laughs> Specifically, you have one that literally is in honor of lemon. You yes, have I do. <laughs> little rainbow ones. I mean, they're quite a delight. Oh, I love my little pride ones. Those are so cute. Also, they're fully machine washable. That's the best part. You can simply toss them in the washing machine and they're good as new. So check out all the amazing shoes, bags, and masks available right now at rothys.com slash drink. That's rothys.com, R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash drink. Style and sustainability meet to create your new favorites. Head to rothys.com slash drink today. This is episode 207. Also, this is our very first episode of... So uh, we're celebrating four years today. How did we forget to mention That's this? That's right, my dude. Four freaking years. Four years ago yesterday, I posted on Instagram that they asked me if I want to do a podcast. And I said, I don't think so. Thanks, though. And then Blaze <laughs> said, you're really depressed. You need a new hobby. And I said, fine, I guess. And it worked. And look, look how beautiful that. it turned out. We're such... we're. We're our own worst enemy, or it's like, why do you celebrate today? Oh yeah, I guess also today's our four-year anniversary. But <laughs> technically, technically February is the anniversary. The, yeah, so. this is like the conception anniversary. We are, like when we are you pregnant came... with the, We're with pregnant. the podcast. <laughs> We're expecting. We're so. expecting. Oh my anyway, God. someone uh. take that clip and really like destroy the gossip tabloids. Oh, yikes. The podcast tabloids, you know them. You know, um, you've heard. It's just me and um, tweeting. But also, wait a minute. If someone hasn't created a National Enquirer about just podcast stars yet, that's what this year is about for me. TM, 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 TM. Okay, no one else. That's us. That's you've me. never heard about it. The very first story, hot off the press, we are expecting. Oh. <laughs> Four years later, <laughs> but it's okay. Oh, also, <clears throat> sorry, I know we have to start the episode, but this is also the first episode ever not under the Trump, Trump administration because we started in 2017 and Trump had been nominated. Well, this probably aligns with my depression. It's making a lot of sense now, but we started in 2017. And so we have never done an episode under any other administration besides Trump. I know. And looks like they're having, I don't know what, what? an aneurysm. <laughs> Are you okay? I never knew that. I never put that together. Whoa. Wow. So something good came out of Trump's administration. Got no, it. we'll okay. see how this goes. I mean, I hope we can do it. I'm a little Joe, nervous. Joe Biden on. might be our, uh, might be the, the end of it all for us. I Joseph. <laughs> Help. Joseph, get us a girl, get it together. Okay. <laughs> um, hmm. Wow. So we're expecting, and Trump isn't a part of it, which is nice. Trump's been, uh, does not have custody any longer. I love that. Oh my God. <laughs> That's so special. It okay. is special. It's wow. trash day. It's tr Our Elect conception day is trash. Elect your fucking trash. 
uh okay yikes welcome to 207 apparently 200 plus episodes later we're finally out of the woods with trump yikes um and i'm going to cover a story that has a lot of names to it it is best known as the cheltenham chel fuck chel cheltenham it does have a lot of names you've already said four different ones it's it's english so it's got that fancy looking name how do yeah. you spell it? Cheltenham. Oh, yeah. Cheltenham is yeah. what I would say if I were and being it's... ignorant, which I am. <laughs> Welcome. Um, and it's called the Cheltenham Ghost because it is from Cheltenham, which is in Gloucestershire. So, I mean, like, <laughs> aka Gloucestershire. So, like, excuse me, England, with <laughs> your fucking Gloucestershire. Words. Who knows? You know it. You know it well. Um, so the Cheltenham ghost, it's also known as the Pitville ghost, it's known as the Morton ghost, and it's known as the Denors poltergeist. Oh my. Um, a lot of names. They all have to do with basically like one of the basic facts of the story, mainly the location. Um, so the, the reason it's called the Morton ghost sometimes is because up until 1948, um, the identities of the family were concealed until and that was the plan until everyone had passed away and then they would announce the actual names of oh. the family members involved so their code name or their fake family name everyone knew them by was the mortons so that's why they were called the morton ghost got it and i'll get through why they're why it's named all the other basically the other names have to do with the location denor is the name of the actual house you know how like fancy houses have their own names oh yeah like mine well the dilbert ever, the dilbert m M&M machine casa Yikes. I we've Mansion. never come up we well ever since we watched Charmed, I told Allison that this oh, yeah. apartment is called the Manor, which oh, I really manor. that's good. I really love that because they would always be like, Oh my god, there's another demon meet me back at the manor. And I was like I love that the manor. I was like, okay. And so I don't use it as often as I should, but maybe that should be my resolution for 2021, where Anytime Allison's like, where are you? I'll be like, the manor. But also, we're in a pandemic. You fucking knew that. So nice Stop. try, witch. Stop Stinky asking witch. about the manor. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's all coming together. Okay. Um, anyway, so the house's name is Denor. So that's how Denor's poltergeist comes out. It's also called the Pitville Ghost because it was on Pitville Circus Road. Didn't call it the Circus Ghost. That would have been more fun, but whatever. And then Cheltenham is because that's the part of Gloucestershire. It's so this has to do with the Despard family, uh, D-E-S-P-A-R-D. So I think Despard, Despard. Sure. The patriarch of this family is uh, Frederick Despard. Um, he's from Ireland. He's in his 50s. He's an army vet. And he is well-traveled, as you can tell by his children's birth certificates. They were all born between 1858 and in 1876 and almost all of them are born in like totally different places whoa i know one of them was actually born in a few of them were born in cheltenham one was born like tanzania one was born oh my god i mean all over the, the channel islands yeah so just a fun fact for you in 1858 the same year that his firstborn uh showed up i suppose frederick's wife his her name was rosina meredith despard and she died from an unknown cause, but it was likely from childbirth from their oldest kid, who was their daughter named Frida, I guess after Fred. So after his wife died in the same year, he remarried to a woman named Harriet Ann Nixon. So then they have children, Fred and Harriet. The first one's name is Rosina, I guess after the first wife, which is kind of odd. Interesting. Um, and then they have another daughter named Edith. They have two more daughters, Lillian and Mabel. And then they have a son, Henry, and then another son, Wilfred. Oh, I so. love all these old timey names. I love I know. it. I, Mabel. That's kind of, it's fun. I know. I, like I love grandma names like Edith. That's just so much fun. Um, ugh, yeah. <laughs> you don't? Oh, I love it. I was trying to think of like, what's the most grandma name I could think of. And I kind of failed myself because I was like, I couldn't think of anything on the spot. Uh, Ethel? Agnes? Ethel, uh, Eloise? Eustace? Alice? <laughs> You're coming up with some wild ones. I'm yeah. trying to think of the most bananas old one. Um, fun fact, when Allison lived in Geraldine. Tanzania, Sorry. Uh, Geraldine. When uh, Allison lived in 
Tanzania, they would call her Alice. Because I, I guess like that name. That was also yeah. the name of my imaginary friend who was an old lady ghost, apparently. So story for another day. I don't even want to I do. You told know. me that. I what? said I had a, I said I had an imaginary friend. Her name was Alice. And I started describing her and I was like, it's really weird because our family friend Alice had just died. And you were like, well, what did Alice look like? And I was like, well, she had long gray hair. And you were like, Christine. And I, mean, I was like, uh, I don't remember the conversation, but I agree with myself. I'm pretty that- sure it was the week we met. Like we had, we had literally not even started the podcast yet. We hadn't even conceived yet. And you were like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Christine, I hate to tell you this. And I was like, no way. And you were like, Christine, think, listen to what you're saying. This is an old lady following you. <laughs> so I can't believe I wanted to conceive with you after that. That's the craziest <laughs> yeah, part. Listen, you knew what you were getting into. Okay. I was like, that's the one. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so they all have old people names. I do like the name Henry a lot. I love um, that name too. So in 1882, this is where the beginning of like the real nuts and bolts of the story are um so the family moves on to pitville circus road and they move into the denor house apparently the house had live-in servants a coachman a gardener so i would say they were pretty uh, well to do i, I would as think a family. Yeah. um at this point rosina the daughter is 19 she's more or less the main character i, I had a hard time understanding if she was the the main character or if it was kind of her and a gaggle of her siblings that were a part of the story um but she's the one that gets mentioned the most so i'd say she has a little more star power um so she's 19 and the whole story really starts where one night in her room she hears someone at the door and she thinks it's her mom and she opens the door to see what her mom wants now i'm going to tell you a quote that's kind of long but what's fun about it is the any quotes that i give you in these notes are all from re- actual reports from the SPR, from the Society of oh, Psychical Research. Cool. Um, so here is the first quote. This is what Rosina says happened once she opened the door to expect her mom there. I saw no one, but on going a few steps along the passage, I saw the figure of a tall lady dressed in black standing at the head of the stairs. After a few moments, she descended the stairs and I followed for a short distance, feeling curious of what it could be. I, I had only a small piece of candle and it suddenly burnt itself out and being unable to see more, I went back to my room, which I imagine is like from a horror movie, like, oh no, the candle's burnt out. And now the whole place is pitch black. Yikes. Yeah, no thanks. Um, the figure was that of a tall lady dressed in black of a soft woolen material, judging from the slight sound in moving. Ugh. And the face was hidden in a handkerchief held up in the right hand. This is all I noticed, but on further occasions, when I was able to observe her more closely, I saw the upper part of the left side of her forehead and a little of the hair above. So just right at the forehead. Okay. Um, and Allison is walking in <gasps> while I record. <laughs> you like <laughs> glanced above the laptop. <sighs> I thought it was the end of you. She just barged in here like she owns the damn place. Okay. (laughs) She's like, this is my manor. Okay. (laughs) I am the stinky witch of this manor. Thank you. Yeah. She's, (laughs) I know exactly what she had to say. And it was those words verbatim. Um, (laughs) So where were we? Oh yeah. You could see her hairline basically. Uh, The face was hidden in a handkerchief held in the right hand. Uh, This is all I noticed, but on further occasions, I saw the left side of her forehead. Her left hand was nearly hidden by her sleeve and a fold of her dress. As she held it down, a portion of a widow's cuff was visible on both wrists so that the whole impression was that of a lady in widow's weeds, which Mm. I will get into widow's weeds in a second. Okay. Um, But yeah, so that was her experience, her first experience. Um, So the figure was also said to have worn a bonnet with either a really long veil or a hood. And she basically looked like a woman in mourning. Okay. Um, and Rosina only told this to her servant, Miss Campbell. Um, but her sister Frida also ended up seeing a woman in black later. Frida saw a figure crossing the hallway, and Frida thought that it was a visiting nun. Oh, sure. That happens so, sometimes. You know, just my my, my nun that walks around just the manor through, just goes through walls and up and down in the floor. Um. Also, one of the maids saw a figure and thought it was an intruder. Uh, The youngest son, Wilfred, and his friend were on the terrace when they saw a woman in the uh, drawing room, which hysterical, which we have those now. 
she uh, the two boys they saw a woman in distress in the drawing room sobbing when they went into the drawing room to check on this woman and ask who she was apparently the room was empty and the maid said that nobody had been there Ooh. uh so then in 1884 two years later it, this is kind of like the real peak of their paranormal experience, all of the siblings. So Rosina is having a lot of paranormal experiences with this woman. Um, she once even saw the ghost standing silently in the drawing room for 30 minutes straight. <gasps> Which like, did you time that? Did you take your eyes off of her? Did you walk and see her and a half an hour later see her again? I don't know if, was she just doing this for 30 minutes? And <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> on minute 31, you were like, this is too much. I lost um, the staring contest. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, so uh, the sister Edith also said that this woman would pass her on the staircase. Ew. Okay. That's creepy. Cause you're like in a confined space. Like you have nowhere to go. A confined space where if you need to escape, you are falling down. Yeah. Right. You're, <laughs> you're, you're going to break a leg. Yeah. There's no getting out of the way. It's uh-uh. Uh-uh, taking the through. tumble. Yeah. <laughs> the only way out is through. <laughs> um, so Edith said, this is a quote from Edith. I saw it cross the hall, push open the drawing room door and go in by herself also Gross. like it uh-uh. i didn't like that either uh-huh. yeah so the most common thread about all of these sightings uh amongst the siblings is that they see a woman's face uh she's always dressed in black and she's always hiding her face and a handkerchief um held in her right hand so okay. that's, nobody ever sees her face um she's also always dressed in widow's weeds so this is where i get into a very unnecessarily long fun fact okay as long as it's fun (laughs) it's fun it's just there's a lot to it so this is where we do a deep dive if you will sure so widow's weeds uh this is old english for the word uh robe weeds is old english for robe um and so it was widow's weeds was basically like the term at the time like the victorian era term for um like your morning grieving attire sure here we go. Fun fact. Widow's weeds are most associated with Queen Victoria because she was known as the ultimate mourner. What could that mean? Christine asks to herself what as well as the mean? audience. Um, so after Prince Albert died, so this is the this is 1861. Um, after Prince Albert died, Queen Victoria was so distraught that she only ever wore black for the rest of her life and basically she was the reason that like mourning and funerals all started this like really black dull attire uh like she basically like revamped in a way the funeral industry in terms of like clothing and accessories she revamped and, it it's like, like even i loved funeral <laughs> chic you know that was our our style in new orleans she is the original fashionista she is the tyra banks of funeral sheet oh wow what an icon queen victoria she really had it in her um (laughs) and so because she wore black for the rest of her life everybody else started assuming that once you are in mourning you wear black all 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 you do is wear black you we're both wearing black black right now by the way we are in mourning of always I'm not sure. Of garbage day, of the, the, we're not in mourning of that, just kidding. No, we're in celebration. That's why you've got a little, you've got a little snap of neon on True. your shirt there. We're in funeral chic, which is not mourning. It's, it's celebration. No, the chic is what makes it right. chic, you know? Correct. Um, so because of her wearing black dress for life and kind of being the catalyst in the funeral industry's fashion world, um cemeteries had an influx in certain monuments and symbolism and quote funerary accessories during queen victoria's reign traditional mourning was that a woman would wear widow's weeds for a very long time after someone they loved died sometimes longer than a year after the death wow um and if a widow left her house everything she wore and everything she brought with her including like her purse her earrings her umbrella her hat her shoes her buckles on her shoes everything had to be black because that was the queen victoria way oh my fashion icon and so even in 1840 there this is just like a fun fact within a fun fact 20 years before this happened there was a work woman's guide that showed you how long you were actually supposed to traditionally mourn a person and here's a dash of patriarchy for you. And by a dash, I mean a gallon. I was like, a dash? Okay. <laughs> so pretend you're in 1840. 
Okay. Got it. It smells real bad. <laughs> I can promise you that much. <laughs> well, there's no deodorant yet. That's for sure. No native. Um, <laughs> no native. I don't know where my candy cane deodorant is, but that it's would not be here. so depressing without it. Uh, so okay, it's 1840. Blaze dies. Right. Oh. Okay. We're talking about well, death here. Well, what did you I for- think? Was I forgot. Happen? I was really like prepping myself for just like you take me on a, a ride, and you are. I'm thinking for a, a ride with a steep hill. Um, <laughs> so if Blaze died, you would be expected to mourn. And by mourn, I mean wear these widow's weeds, never go out in public without wearing uh, not only black, because this was 20 years before she had kind of made that rule, but go into mourning, not see anybody else, not date anybody else, not sure. really leave your home unless necessary. You would be mourning expectedly for two and a half years. Woof. If bl- if you died, here's the patriarchy. Blaze was only expected to mourn for three months. Oh, so rough. It's so rough being a woman. Ah. Um. So anyway, excuse me, I just burped. Um. This that- is <laughs> we're we're dismantling the patriarchy one minute at a time. So that's just a fun fact within a fun fact. So back to the 1860s with Queen Victoria, just like really showing us up on the runway. Um, while mourning her husband, uh, Queen Victoria, because you had to wear everything black, she also started wearing, she didn't want to stop wearing jewelry. So she made jewelry instead of out of like diamonds or pearls or anything. She only wore jewelry made out of fossilized carbon. Whoa. (laughs) Okay. Which makes it look like black glass almost. Cool. Um, and so that was called apparently that combination or the the fossilized carbon its nickname was jet and so fun fact that's where jet black comes from no way yes that's crazy i had no idea funerary fashion fun fact quadruple f for you oh i love it so jet black comes from the jewelry she used to wear when she was mourning her husband in the 1860s that's fascinating so all of that basically to tell you that queen victoria is the reason that now when you see a woman in black it is especially as a ghost when you see a woman in black <laughs> it's, it's, it's mainly the thought is that oh she's in mourning or she's grieving someone sure. because of the fashion from then which then makes me wonder so pre-1860s if we see a woman in black as a ghost like what does that mean like mm-hmm. did she just really dig black was she ahead of her time maybe oh or maybe she was just um a spinster maybe but i would think fancy clothes only black i don't know (laughs) i don't know Um, well i do think it would be if i were to like pretend like i was an expert and like i was a historian in terms of ghosts if someone showed me a picture of like a woman in black i would like to look really arrogant and be like "Mm, so it's it's post 1860s era because (laughs) obviously the funerary (laughs) fashion of the time you know so i if you want to sound like a super douche if anyone ever mentions a woman in black you could probably bet that it was after 1860. (laughs) um so uh let's see so that was just a very long-winded downward spiral of a fun fact love it but to let you know that the main ghost that everyone is seeing in this house and the only ghost that everyone's seeing in this house they're all describing her basically as a woman in black and more and more folks are witnessing this apparition it's not just rosina anymore it's not just the siblings they're having visitors come in who are starting to notice this woman and people are mistaking her for like a solid figure living breathing human being oh my. she's like there's no doubt about it. This is a living human walking around. And then the only reason they say otherwise later is because she disappears into thin air. Um, so she was starting to get really comfortable around the family, I guess. And this setup where she was showing herself for like 30 minutes at a time became more and more frequent. Um, so it was the people were just getting used to her just being in the room for 30 minutes at a time and then vanishing. Ugh. Um, and as time went on, she also began to try to speak to Rosina. Oh, no, I don't like that. She's like gathering power. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. I hadn't even thought of that. It's I was just horrifying. thinking she was getting like comfy with the kids, like a mm. like a Mary Poppins, if you will. But the funeral chic Mary Poppins. Um, <laughs> so basically she's trying to speak she never actually does successfully speak i'll 
before people get super creeped out. That's not what happened. I think that's but... almost creepier that she's trying to speak and can't. Like, uh... okay, you're not wrong about Listen, that. Listen, I don't know. I'm just making uh, shit up left and right, but. You're right. I feel like at least if she could speak, we would know what she wanted. Right. And maybe it would be like, uh, it's a beautiful weather outside. Like maybe it's something really <laughs> inane and it's like not even frightening. Excuse me, good madam. Um, My body is not buried in the right spot. If you could just move me three shifted. feet to the yeah. left, I won't bother you ever again. <laughs> and then be like, oh, well, problem solved. <laughs> um, But no, so... I guess she was, she could not speak, but she would try to. Um, So this is another quote from Rosina. She came in the drawing room and walked to the sofa. So I went up to her and I asked if I could help her. The fact that you can approach her to me freaks me out because usually you see something from the corner of your eye, you blink and it's gone. Right. This woman sees you beelining towards her and she's like, what about it? You know? (laughs) She's like, I can't talk, but I can stare at you. I can sure as hell look at you. Hold my ground. Yeah. Um. Uh, Oh, so I went up to her and asked if I could help her. She moved and I thought she was going to speak, but she only gave a slight gasp and moved towards the door. I spoke (laughs) to her again, but she seemed as if she was unable to speak. So now this person is like gasping for air, trying to talk to you and it's not coming out. So goose cam. Um, so during this time, there were reports coming in uh, from, again, visitors and the siblings that they were all hearing footsteps on the landing, and they were feeling this sense of being stared at, especially one of the daughters, I think it was Edith, um, who would say, I felt an icy cold shiver, and the figure bent over me as if to turn the pages of my song book. Ooh. So that's like, I was going to make a joke about that's not really Mary Poppins. That's more like Maria from Sound of Music, like making, helping you out with the, with the music. But uh, in terms of helping you with a songbook, I don't know if I would like that you're fucking with my stuff now. Yeah. Like, I feel like if this, if this person is just playing the piano or playing the guitar or something, and this ghost is now messing with your stuff, it's like, it's trying to interact with you, which I really hate. Yeah. And it's like getting better at it, which I also hate. And because it's solid, and now it can also touch things. It's not like, mm-hmm. oh, it looks solid, but it only goes through things, or it can't actually grab other solid things. It's like, oh, no, it's able to turn pages for you. It's able to... Ugh. Wait, but did she say it did turn the page? I thought she said it looked like it was trying to or going to. As, as if to turn the pages of my song, but hmm, you're right. So maybe it just like acted that way and didn't actually... I don't like that she had the confidence that... No, certainly guess. not. She needs to <laughs> sit down. That way. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be like, first of all, don't touch my shit. I'm clearly trying to make music happen. Also, I'm pretending this is a recital and you keep interrupting. Also, don't come at me because, like, I like we sh- we, I think innately should want to be away from each other, like have some distance. But you're yeah. getting, you're approaching me. Okay, with but an what intent. if, what if the song was, what if she was helping? Like, oh, the song's reaching the next page, so she was gonna turn it for me. You know, <sighs> but still, I don't love it. I'd be like, I can what turn it she- myself. Thank you. It would be super eerie if she was trying to turn the page to a song that like whose title had a message in it or something like, Ooh. like help me. I don't know what song. By Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> Featuring Mozart. The um, sonata. <laughs> <laughs> I'm buried two feet, three feet to the right. Help. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Starring Maria from Sound of Music and Mary Poppins. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, one of the main visitors, I guess he was a childhood friend, so he would come over to the house a lot, and therefore the spirit was be getting comfortable with this guy also. His name was George Gooding, and he saw a lot of ghosts, uh, or he didn't see a lot of ghosts, he saw the ghosts a lot of times, sorry. But he also uh, told the SPR that apparently the family dogs would act really distressed whenever he knew the ghost was about to appear. Oh, so that was like almost his, sad. almost his cue of like, oh, the animal. Well, I mean, it makes sense to me though, because how often do we hear stories where animals are yeah. freaking out and then something creepy happens? Ugh. So he said that the dogs would always get really excitable, but the family cats didn't give a shit, which like <laughs> <surprise>. classic. <laughs> one time, one time the uh, one time George actually got all the kids to form a circle and hold hands around the ghost, which sounds very seancey, but really the goal was to just corner her. Which oh. is so stupid in my mind when like she's known to just vanish, vanish into thin air. So they tried to corner her and then she just like walked through them and disappeared. And then they were like, ah, rats, like didn't work. <laughs> Back to the drawing board, I guess. So uh, he did, 
he was on to something though because this became a regular thing in the household where the kids would try to corner the ghost that's a fun game though it was very like ring around the rosy but like ring around the dead lady ghost ring around the i was trying to think of what rhymes with rosy but nothing specifically paranormal the ghosty ring around the ghosty yikes sure stop it take me out uh but this became a regular thing where they were trying to trap the ghost which means they were literally trying to build traps at one point and um like they tried to use cords and trip the ghost they really didn't get it through their heads so like this thing was just going to walk through whatever they built <laughs> they tried to trip it that's mean but they were like trying to come up with like little like kevin McAllister traps like to, booby traps <laughs> booby traps to try to catch this thing and then they were it never worked um but so anyway that became a, a common thread and then in august 1884 this is like two years into them having such a regular bond i would say with this ghost that it sounds like this is super frequent but rosina finally decides okay siblings we're gonna tell the parents about this ghost this whole time the parents didn't oh what know. they didn't know i thought this was like a like a, a family fam- affair yeah, yeah nope apparently the parents had no idea it was just the siblings and this george guy and the animals and the visitors who thought this was a nun or something so uh rosina told the parents uh about the ghost and they surprisingly took it seriously like us i mean i'm not sure why i said surprisingly i well it is i feel like most of the time parents don't seem to especially in like the 1800s i just imagine them going like oh that's rubbish and then walking away and then like getting on a horse and never coming home or something that i don't sounds, really that sounds pretty accurate sounds historical i mean you are a historian so like mm-hmm. whatever mm-hmm. yeah they just say no no that's not true and then they go hang out with queen victoria um <laughs> but the parents did take it seriously which i guess we also would have done and they go to the landlord about it they're like okay so like what's the history of this house and uh this is again another probably unnecessary deep dive but the landlord gives a history of the home that says it was built in 1860 hey hey oh same time as queen victoria's fashion came through. oh i didn't even put that together i was like cool why are you making that (laughs) hand motion at me (laughs) and uh and apparently it used to be a market square garden fun fact it was called garden reach and garden reach had uh orchards and large lawns and it was super populated eventually the property was bought by a guy named henry um and henry swinhoe was his last name oh henry was married to a woman named elizabeth in 1851 they had five kids the wife died he remarried in 1870 and this new wife's name was Imogen and they would get into a lot of fights about oh. a lot of things they were not a happy couple specifically about how the kids were brought being brought up Imogen didn't like that oh. Imogen also didn't like um that when his first wife died Henry didn't give her all of his wife's jewelry didn't that give was- Imogen all of his wife his now deceased wife number- wife's wife number two was mad that she did not inherit wife number one's jewelry from the oh husband. okay that was like the big fight that they like weird but all right i mean someone's yeah, got to wear it i guess that was imogen's thing um apparently henry did still have the jewelry um but he hid it under the oh. floors he hid it under the floorboards of the drawing room oh <gasps> this is so interesting okay sorry <laughs> Thank I'm you. just thinking like all the, the theories of like what she's doing there in the drawing room anyway I like to think that if I were like a math teacher like that's the sound I would want to hear from all of my kids though like <gasps> this is so interesting but then that's, I'd be like this is how the quadratic equation works <gasps> quad- but honestly if someone ever said like oh that's so interesting I'd be like you're being a shitty I would teacher. literally be like go to the principal <laughs> you little piece like, of- even if you meant it it hurt me so can yeah. you go <laughs> Yeah, like, you don't need to mock me, okay? <laughs> it's like, sounds very rude. That really happened. It took me a long time to figure out long division. I think I've discussed this before on the show, but I figured it out way too late in the game. Like by the time calculators were- I have no idea how to do long division. I'll be honest with you. No One clue. time I went on a date with a math teacher and on our first date, I was like, can you teach me long division? 
I wish I could learn it. Somebody teach me. It's it's the care. I can get to it to a certain point. And then it's like, wait, I cross something out and I carry something and I lose it. I can't, I can't remember. Well, I, I, I f- clearly forgot about it because then I asked this girl on the date about it. So clearly it didn't stick with me. But there was a moment senior year of high school where someone taught me long division or the math teacher taught me long division on a during our break. And I went, oh, that, I get it. I get it. And I definitely looked like an asshole. Like, but really I had just figured out something I should have learned a decade ago. <laughs> well, listen, I would have been impressed. I, I wish you could teach. I wish someone could teach me. I, uh, let me call that person. I never went on a date with again. Uh, that person you, you ghosted and <laughs> see if I didn't they ghost help. them. I'm just I, kidding. <laughs> I didn't ghost them. They were just weird as shit. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I made sure they knew we were not going to be going out another the date. podcast? That would they be really don't. awkward. Okay. They don't. And even if we do, she deserves to know that that was a terrible date. Um, <laughs> it was so fucking bad. Um, it was Pokemon Girl. <gasps> well, yeah. you didn't tell me that. Yeah, Pokemon Girl was a math teacher. I did not know that. Uh, by okay, the way, woof. it's not meant to be an insult to Pokemon. Pokemon just got mentioned a lot. It's just the lot. title. Yeah, that's just the title of this particular date. Pokemon got mentioned a lot during that date, and therefore I just this know her as Pokemon Girl. One of the first conversations Em and I ever had, we were at the farm, uh, and we were like, so what do you want to talk about? And I was like, I guess I can tell you about this weird date I went on. That's true. I remember I remember we were sitting at the table. I, yes, I just got my poppy loaf. I was going to say, I just bought my poppy loaf. <laughs> but yeah, Pokemon Girl is real fucking odd. Um, yeah. Anyway, I hope you're doing well. Uh, <laughs> M rolls her eyes. <laughs> hope you're doing well. Teaching math. You did teach me long division very well. That was probably the best part of the entire day. <laughs> I wanted to show you, I want to do a little fashion show. I just got some really cute sweaters from Stitch Fix. And I just was like, how does this person who's designing my box and like getting my fix ready know exactly? Like I kept everything because everything in it, I was like, this is me. This is my clothes. I'm so excited. I've used Stitch Fix for years now. And most of the things I bring with me on tour are because yeah. literally a random person knew exactly what my uh-huh. style was and purchased it. Better than I got did. Together for me. Yes, exactly. It's crazy. They offer clothing hand selected by expert stylists for your unique size, style, and budget, which is also helpful. You know, if mm-hmm. you want to spend a certain amount on uh, pants, but not on sweaters, like you can definitely arrange that. And you can try on pieces at home before you buy, keep what you love, and then return what you don't. And they have free shipping, easy returns and exchange and they include a prepaid return envelope in each fix. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash drink and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash drink for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash drink. So I know this is something that we all do, but guess what? Our eyes actually weren't meant to look at screens all day because it messes with our internal balance and then it affects our sleep, causes stress, headaches, blurry vision, and eye fatigue. It's not great. Can confirm, Christine. And thank God we have Felix Gray. (laughs) Thank God. (laughs) Thank thank the Lord. (laughs) Felix Gray glasses actually filter 15 times more blue light from screens than other clear blue light lenses to help restore your balance. Um, And the original optical lenses relieve most eye strain symptoms from daily screen time. And they also have advanced sleep glasses, which are the ones Blaze has, um, that relieve serious daily eye strain. And they were specially designed for late night screen time. So they help improve your sleep, which is amazing. I also got my mom some Felix Gray for uh, for Christmas and Aww. it worked out perfectly because that woman is a night owl when it comes to her screens and <laughs> she's actually getting sleep now. Finally, a pair of glasses designed for the 21st century. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash drink to shop glasses that work as hard as you do. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash drink. Free shipping, free exchanges, 30 day money back guarantee, felixgrayglasses.com slash drink. <laughs> So yeah, Henry and Imogen, Henry had all of the uh, jewelry hidden under the floorboards of the drawing room. And Henry also became an alcoholic. Some stories say that Imogen also became an alcoholic just because they were always fighting with each other. Apparently they were such a scandalous couple that newspapers were keeping tabs on their relationship, which sounds a lot like my National Enquirer idea for the pod. TM, TM. TM, TM, TM. I'll just, every episode or every uh, cover, it'll be like Em and Christine fighting again and it'll just be like us like looking so scowling and then it'll be the the tear in between our photos (laughs) explosive conversation heard by a source and that source is eva every fucking time it's always eva always fucking eva 
anything for a story. Oh. Um, but so apparently the newspapers kept tabs on them. In 1876, they ended up officially breaking up, but they went to court a lot for very stupid things. Um, in the divorce petition, it said that Imogen had been known for drunkenness and decent language, which sounds just like any old friend of mine. And she <laughs> allegedly also would throw furniture at him. She also accused him in front of his children and the servants of cheating on her with one of the housemaids. Oh boy. Um, she also accused him that one of the housemaids children was his illegitimate child. Um, and uh, oh, and that she was, she also ended up being seen in the court as being super violent and unstable. So no one totally knew if they could believe her oh, accusations. Gosh. Meanwhile, Henry on the other side was part of a lot of slander cases for like, he like one time said that the milkman was abusive to a, like the neighbor's dog or something. Oh. Um, he also threatened to shoot a boy because the boy assaulted one of his servants. Um, he also went to court and was found guilty of putting a stick into a wheel of a stroller so like a baby would flip out of the stroller. Oh my God. But like all it's... of it, like he was found guilty, but like, at the same time, it's like there were just so many wild stories. Like this is bananas. Who I mean, do you like, even side with? Get yeah. a hobby. Jeez. <laughs> he has one. It's called sticking a stick in it's a stroller called... and watching babies flip. Like okay? catapulting babies down the road. <laughs> it's my favorite pastime. Jeez. Threatening to shoot little boys. Oh Jesus. my god, this man is very uh, d- unstable. Clearly off the rails. And so uh, anyway, whatever the official reason was for their divorce, they split up. Henry ends up living on this property for a few more months, and then he died that same year. And then uh, when he died, the house was renamed from Garden Reach to Pitville Hall, because it was on Pitville Circus Road. Um, And then uh, at some point, Imogen also died really shortly after he died. The building was purchased again and was changed from Pitville Hall to being called Denor. And that's basically within that time because there had been so much scandal in town about the couple who lived there because they were both really unhappy and both died within the last few years of the house being purchased and because i guess at the time because the building's name kept changing so quickly that was a sign of like it being held under different management or wanting a different reputation or something so just all those things together gave the town a really bad feeling about the house that the property was like cursed in some way or haunted it's like cecil hotel trying to rename itself yeah <laughs> it's exactly like, it's not gonna work so, yeah we still remember what it was called last week dude um, <laughs> but uh so basically all of those things together had the landlord give the despard family the house for a really low a really low price because they just wanted to be able to sell it to someone sure and they made the disbarred family uh, promise to like not perpetuate any stories of the building being haunted because they didn't want anyone to like keep that reputation going. Yeah. But even though the family never said anything or maybe even didn't know about it until super late, there were still servants that were quitting on, like on, on the spot and fleeing the house because they were seeing this woman in black just showing up out of nowhere so even though nobody was talking about it there was still something everyone was seeing and experiencing it was in the inquire the national inquirer i wrote it myself so <laughs> i'm sure you did <laughs> uh and then also like i mean one example was that their neighbor heard a woman crying in the orchard and they thought it was one of the siblings who was visiting the house um right. And I guess, I guess it was the oldest one, Frida, she was visiting after her like son had just died or something. Oh. And so the neighbor thought like, oh, I hear Frida crying in the orchard because she's grieving her son. So he sent his son over to go check on Frida. And he said like, oh, Frida looks like this. Like, I guess they'd never seen each other <laughs> and was like, oh, well, go check on Frida. She looks like this. And apparently the woman that he described did not at all fit the description of Frida and oh. Frida wasn't in the orchard that day. So he, he now saw and heard a grieving woman that everyone else had been seeing because it fit the same description, but now she's moving out to the orchard. Not oh just God. In, in she's the spreading. She's spreading. I don't like it. So what's weird is in 1885, uh, the ghost became more transparent. So instead of being super solid, she's starting to be kind of see-through. Which is I dumbass thought you meant like she became more honest about everything. <laughs> I was like, that's she nice. Really, she really started like looking in the mirror. You to know? open up. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. 
uh, but no, so in 1885, she like physically start visibly was more clear, wow. which is interesting. It's almost like her energy wasn't as strong anymore. Finally, geez, I was getting nervous. Finally. She was like growing and growing. Um, after, during that time, people started seeing her less and less. And by 1889, um, I don't, I think she just completely faded away. And then soon after that, even like the, the weird sounds like footsteps also started fading away throughout the house. Mm -hmm. Um, so by 1890, there was just no sign of her. Um, Rosina also ended up deciding at this point to figure out who the woman was because she wanted an explanation. Um, and she assumes she never got a full answer, but she assumes at this point that it was probably Imogen right. um, for a few reasons. And like her specific ones were that Imogen is the only person who had uh, any resemblance to the figure everyone saw. Uh, the widow's garb that she wore didn't match Henry's first wife. So must be the second wife. <laughs> um, and uh, oh, sorry, there was a truck that went by. Um, every time you like flinch i'm like oh we're doomed she's back she's gained all her power it took her 130 years <laughs> God. um apparently so this is another quote from her another reason why she thinks it's imogen although none of us had ever seen imogen several people who had known her identified her from our description also on being shown a photo album i picked out one of her sisters uh and said that she was the that she was most like the figure and we were told that uh, Imogen and her sisters looked a lot alike. So if you're mm. saying that this random woman looked a lot like the figure you're seeing and Imogen uh, looked like her, makes sense. probably Imogen. Um, also, apparently her stepdaughter and others had told her that she, I guess Imogen, her stepdaughters as an Imogen stepdaughters who they had found or made contact with said that Imogen loved the front drawing room, just loved being Aww. there. Well, she's looking for all his jewels under the floor. Exactly. Also, there's the note of like, hey, all the jewelry you wanted that tore apart your marriage is yeah. in that room. Um, so others say that uh, the ghost could be like uh, like the mistress of someone who lived there or something or like another housemate or something. But mostly people assume it's Imogen. Um, and the Despards even though they moved to the house and that's when this big story of the ghost really showed up, people were seeing this ghost before they even got there, which was interesting oh. to the SPR because they were trying to investigate this. And they were like, if it was all smoke and mirrors made by the Despard family, then explain why people were seeing it before they even moved in. True. That's a very good point. Yeah. So um, they did their homework and they they tried to find as many people as possible who had seen the ghost before the Despards even moved in. Basically the whole neighborhood at one point or another, they'd all seen someone. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd all seen a, a woman in black either walking down the street, turning a corner, up in the window, out in the Oof. garden. Everyone had seen a woman in black at some point. So in 1892, the this officially became uh, like a case that the SPR was working on because they wrote an account about this ghost called the record of a haunted house, which seems very vague to me. <laughs> but back then you could name anything, anything because it doesn't exist yet. Now I'm sure there's 10 right. Also, Yeah. Also because like they probably had a, a whole 10 articles and they were like, this'll do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the founders of uh, SPR, his name was Frederick Myers. And I guess he lived in the area at the time. And so he was really interested in the case and that's why he brought it to the SPR and they investigated it before any other accounts. Um, so the SPR found that Rosina actually kept records, which is how they were able to pull so many quotes um, to put in their own report. So a oh, lot of their cool. reports are straightforward, direct quotes from Rosina because she had kept all of her accounts written down. She like kept notes of every time she saw the spirit. Right. And so that was really helpful for them to compile their own record. I said earlier that she never told anybody about the spirit except for Miss Campbell, who some sources said it was her servant. Some said it was her friend. Maybe it was both. But so they were able to get all their information from letters that Rosina had written to Miss Campbell, which mm. makes me think, hmm, why did they have to write letters to each other and be all hush hush if they lived in the same house? Um, or if yeah, they were really odd. good friends. And so there is the speculation that they were lovers. Ooh, 
Ooh, okay. Spicy. Any, anywhere to bring the gays in, I'm going to do it. Um, interestingly, this rumor, again, for the tabloids, if you will, um, I should just start my own SPR. I mean, I'm part of the I, SPR, but I should make my own. That's just the gossip mill of just like. Hell yeah. But just like brand. So you need to keep your spot in the SPR, but, mm-hmm. but keep this, this part on the DL and then gather information as you go and then like keep notes. And then later you can just like do a tell all expose. You know, what, you know, what terrifies me is that when I joined the SPR, the person who I uh, got my like congratulations letter from said like, oh, I listened to your podcast. No, went, no. Oh, are you cute. serious right now which, which means the spr is keeping tabs on this man so what happens when you're i know you told me you're in it what does that mean like do you have to like do work for it or like is no it's it just, it like, just an like honorary thing so i'm part of the spr i'm also part of the aspr which is the american spr sure um i'm part of the ghost club i'm part of the parapsychological association they're all more or less if you're really invested you can do zoom meetings so i've done zoom meetings with the ghost club and the spr because historically those are the oldest ones and have, I talk about them a lot on the show, like Harry Price was in both sure. of them, Houdini was in them. So like they mean more to me. Um, so you just do Zoom meetings and people either share stories or a lot of them are scientists. And so they hold conferences and lectures on like the science of this or the science of that, or like, is it really telekinesis or is it, you know, <gasps> it's like- um, I'm so j- Like so science cool. lectures. Um, just got chills. But uh, there's also like the real big perk that you get is that they all have their own like monthly journals. And so just like how I say, oh, oh the SPR put out a report, they still do that. And uh, every month we get like a, a new, basically a newsletter, a glorified newsletter, but it's like a science articles. Like a journal type thing. Like a journal. Maybe. And like Ghost Club specifically is really liberal. Like it's basically if you want to write anything, if you want to oh. write an article for the Ghost Club, go for it. And uh, people will post, there's like a whole section where people just write their own ghost stories and not like write fake ones, but they'll tell their own experiences or, um, are the memberships paid? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's how the only way they can fund that makes it. Sense. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, so they, uh, what was I going to say? Sorry. Shit. Shit. No, no, no. I was going to say something about the ghost club and I totally forgot. But they have, uh, it's basically just Zoom meetings and monthly journals oh, that you get from them. so cool. But you can submit your own stuff. I forget what I was about to say. Shit. You said people write They're, their ghost stories and. I don't remember. They also do their own investigations. So like, if you want to, unfortunately, I can't be a part of the SPR one because they're literally not in America. Right. Um, but if I ever were to be in England, I could go to like one of their chapter meetings or something or hop onto a cool. investigation if I wanted to. So yeah. I'm so jealous. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I want to do like a zoom with you to hear about the zooms with them. They're surprisingly dry. I wanted it to be like, um, like ghostbusters, but like, <laughs> it's very much like minutes, you know? So yeah. Anyway, cool. it's fun. I, I, I like it, but unless you're like in it for the also boring stuff, then probably shouldn't be a part of it but if you are into that stuff and you want to be a member like me join the (gasps) spr or the ghost club or parapsychological association um and then by the way a lot of them too there's different tiers to what membership you are and you get different access to stuff it's like access to like different conferences and discounts to i think one of them is discounts to merch I don't think actually any of them have merch. It sounds like a Patreon. <laughs> it sounds like Patreon, yeah. But they're, it's like a very expensive Patreon. It's like, oh, I God. think there's uh, there's one where like the top tier is like $500. Oh, wow. So it's like a donation a to any society. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, yeah. like at there's a museum one... or something where you are like levels of contributor and stuff. Yeah, it, I mean, and the super expensive one, I'm not a part of that one. I think that's called the Rhine Association or the Rhine Society or something. The Soros, no. Rhinoceros. <laughs> I didn't even say right. Rhinoceros. I'm such um, a dumbass. Sorry. But no, the because JB Ryan was a big guy in, in oh. a, a psychical stuff. So the Ryan something. I know that there's like a, a tier there where I was like, holy shit, I'm never gonna pay that much. I'm also part of MUFON that basically does. Yeah, the that same was thing. what I was gonna mention. Yeah. MUFON is I would say the most fun of them all because it's UFOs and stuff. But MUFON also, there's something I really want to do that I've told Eva about, but I don't wanna say it too much because I don't wanna like 
I do want to manifest it, but I'm scared at the same time. But apparently they have like, um, like an, an invest, like they train you to be a UFO field investigator. <gasps> and you like have to do that. I really want to. I think it'd be like a cool little Patreon video if like I filmed my experience. Yeah, dude. Doing it. it would be a cool <laughs> thing in general without even a video. But their theirs is really fun because uh their monthly newsletters are actually monthly reports on how many sightings around the world. How have you been. never told me this? I'm like getting angry now. You're just like Why? telling me all these cool things you get every month and I'm like, you've never like told me these things. Uh, that sounds they, so fucking cool. A list the best of UFO part- sightings in your inbox. I think there's a way, I think I did it when I first joined and then since then I haven't touched it, but you can log, you can like type in any city and you can see like all the history of the report since like the seventies, but it's, I I don't, if you're part of MUFON, don't listen to this part. I don't think it's maintained very well. Like the website looks like it's like someone's grandpa handling it. Like the (laughs) the merch is, has clearly not been touched since the internet was created. So like, it's like, it's, it's fun, but also like you have a lot of kinks to work around. So, okay. I don't know. I think if, if all of a sudden they gave the job of handling all of the digital stuff to a bunch of 25 year olds, it could really be something. But I think right now it's, Hey, you know what I'm I mean? not 25, but <laughs> I can work a square space. <laughs> you know what? I have thought about that. I was like, if I had more time in my life, I would reach out to them and be like, let me handle those for you. Yeah. I'm but- over here, like offering our services. I'm like, we can barely get like <laughs> an episode out that's not true but we can we have priorities let's put it that way anyway this is a very long-winded way to say the spr had about 10 articles in 1892 and uh that's why this record was called the record of a haunted house and one of the original founders frederick myers was interested in it because he lived in the area um and most of the records came from rosina's letters to miss campbell the part i was trying to get to was that one of the members of spr is the one who spread this rumor that they were lovers. Um, oh. And that member, his name was Eric Dingwall. And I don't know if you remember that name, but he is also the frenemy of Houdini who ended up spreading a bunch of shit about him after <gasps> he died. I did not remember the name, but holy crap. I think I and him reincarnated because I'm really loving the drama he pulls out of stories. Um, you just spread it so when i die you're just gonna start spreading your stupid <laughs> gossip mag. was actually an alien yeah because uh, you're gonna have like full control of your gossip rag and i'm gonna be dead and you're I'll just have gonna finally have... i'll finally gotten access to mufon's behind the like back end of their website and they'll just <laughs> christine's an alien anytime that you like search any city in their database it'll just be like sighting of christine cheaper <laughs> it's just christine she's the only alien well, anyway, Eric Dingwall was one of the people that when Houdini died, he said some like pretty mean shit about Houdini. Uh, I think it was either Houdini or Harry Price, but he wasn't the best like friend an asshole. of them. Yeah. Um, so anyway, in 1893, three years after nobody ever saw the ghost again, or at least the family didn't, the Despards moved out. Five years later, Denor was renamed again to In Holmes, I-N-H-O-L-M-E-S, and it became a boys prep school. Um, after that, it also became a nunnery. It became a nursery college, um, where you could literally go to school to learn to be like a nanny, which is cool. Oh, um, it also became accommodations for the diocese of Gloucester. And then it became apartments. Uh, I think it's still apartments and they're called St. Anne's. As Can you imagine apartments. though, like living in that apartment and it's like, oh, is this place haunted? Well, it was a nunnery, a boy's <laughs> school, a, d- a widow's like home and with jewelry under the floorboards you like any possible literally don't get to speak when you're like oh yeah welcome to my fucking haunted house in cincinnati <laughs> first of all you grew up in that goddamn house behind a cemetery and like the bishop died in the elevator or some bullshit like that <laughs> what happened? you don't get yeah, to speak sort of. how does your house not have a name by the way it really should have some weird ass haunted manner wait what name. my house your mom's house it oh. should have some weird spooky mansion name i think it's a proctor and gamble house or something i don't remember my house actually does have a name which i think i'm sure somebody just gave it like to be fancy it it's because of the owner the people who named it i'm not going to say it because it'll probably let you find it but um it has like when they were trying to post it on like zillow and shit they were like giving it names like this ridiculous name which now i'm like okay they were just trying to make it sound fancy but um 
I'll tell you about it later. It's very weird. Well, anyway, you of all people don't get to talk. I when know. You grew up in <laughs> you're a right, house. You're right. You're right. You grew up in a house as fucking creepy as that, which still looks like it's from the 1700s, but whatever. <laughs> Um, I remember uh, my, my favorite pastime in our relationship has been going to your house with new people to show them how terrifying it is <laughs> to be like, Lisa still has a video of going into the <laughs> attic where all those things are written on all the walls. And like, there's just plaster falling out of the ceiling. And I'm so, like, this is my bedroom. And she's like, Oh my God. One of my prized possessions in my phone is the video of, first of all, my first video ever of going through your house by myself because <laughs> I woke up at 7 a.m. or whatever. And I was like, what haunted where saw am I? set am I on? <laughs> and then the second video is bringing like Christine Maiden or Eva or someone. Or you had Christine like a Maiden. tour going. You were like charging 50, po- 50 bucks a pop. It's like keep your hands people. and feet in the fucking vehicle because this is a <laughs> because scary Because there are house. like nails coming out of the walls and you're going to cut your hand open. Yeah. Uh, anyway, but anyway, it's, it's very creepy. I know. You're right. I take it back. And also your your now house where it's like, oh, it's full of estate sale death items. That's true. So. And there's a staircase literally from an abandoned church. So you're right. Listen, I take it all back. You're anyway, right. the building or the property is now St. Anne's apartment complex. Uh, and in the 1970s, a member of the SPR who was collecting witness statements, um, I guess he was an author writing about the case. And so he was collecting witness statements of various poltergeist activity around the area. And he found that at least 17 people um, had witnessed the woman in black recently and over 20 people had heard weird noises on the grounds. Mm. Um, He also said that evidence of the woman in black or his like final word on it was that evidence for the woman in black, uh, there was the evidence was still there up until at least 1985 um one of them in 1970 was that a woman was taking her driver's test um and when she was on that road in front of the house she had to slam on her brakes and when the teacher said why she looked shocked because she was like didn't you just see the woman in black standing in the middle of the road looking at us and i would have hit her but she like four or five seconds after standing there she vanished away in front of the girl's eyes man she's just a drama queen this lady so as of at least 1985, there were signs that the woman in black is still seen today. I don't know why she took like a hiatus when the family, <laughs> like in 1989, maybe she comes back every hundred years or some bullshit. But um, anyway, that is the story of the Cheltenham <gasps> ghost slash Pitville ghost slash Morton ghost slash Denor's poltergeist. Wow. Ew, that is creepy. That was a Shivery. lot of record. That was a lot of information. Oh, barely God. any of it did you need no i love it there you it's, go oh gives me the creeps dude <clears throat> now something about like the fact that she could like you know what i wonder sorry this is like going totally off the rails but when like maybe she wasn't interacting maybe she was just like standing where she used to stand or something and people thought she could like see them or did they say like she really did interact with the kids and stuff i don't know because when I, I guess the closest thing to interacting I can think of is when the piano. Oh yeah. Because what and if I'm like, but the... I was going to say also that when Rosina was trying to talk to her and she couldn't speak. She <gasps> tried that's to. true. That's true. That's true. Okay. That's the most. Yeah. Cause I was thinking about the piano, like maybe it was a drawing room where there was like a place for a piano. And so there had always been right. a piano there and she was just like, she was just like, it was like repeating. almost like her, yeah. Her residual blueprint yeah. of walking towards them, but mm. didn't actually do anything. But yeah, I, other the than those two thing. you're right other than those and, but also like for all we know like rosina just caught her in the middle of a residual blueprint of trying to talk and not talking true like, so there's no real proof that she was intelligently interacting with people it could have all just been residual stuff man she was creepy though i gotta say mm-hmm. Ugh, yeah there's something extra creepy about that one i don't know why I think it's just the amount that she kept showing up in different places. It's like, uh, yeah, it's just like, can you give it up already? Like, but, and also like, uh, it is interesting where like her energy was dying down at one point, but then she resurfaced in the 1970s. Also, it wasn't even, it wasn't even the 1970s and 1970 was the driver's test girl. And when the author was actually getting all of the information from people, but, uh, 
what I saw online was that at least through the 1940s, 1950s, all the way through the 1980s, that was the range that he was able to find people who had stories. Oh. So, so if she faded away by 1890 and he was able to get new reports of her by 1940, that's only like a 50 year nap. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> nap. And for all we know, because it turned into so many things and so many people were churning in and out of there. That like maybe people had experiences, but like just up and left or moved and yeah. never got to report what they'd seen. I don't know. Fascinating. Fascinating. And so freaking creepy. Ugh. Anyway, um, if you happen to live in the St. Anne's complex, let us know if you see a, a woman in mourning. I would love to know if people today see it. That would be really interesting. Especially because now it would be, we're coming up on another like 50 years or so, right? I yeah. mean, yeah, true. Well, I guess in another 15 years, it would be 50 years. I don't even know if that well, matters. Well, the 70s, but... if it was the 70s, then we'd be like right in the 50-year mark right now. Yeah. So maybe people um, are, are seeing something. Well, also, what was I going to say? Um, also, since now it's an apartment complex, it's all split up. So it makes you wonder, like, is she in certain parts of the house or like... Oh, yeah. Where is the know? drawing board? Yeah. Who has to, the who drawing, has to live in the drawing room? The drawing room. And also, uh, it makes me think, too, with all those renovations, like you would think you'd stir something up, right? True, 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 true. And I probably think there's probably not a piano there anymore. So maybe there's like a lady just bending over. And like, what is she doing? Can you imagine if you have a ghost and you're like, yeah, all she does is bend. I don't get it. I don't know. She's she like wiggles to... her fingers and bends. But you could really, the rumors in my tabloids could really spread something pretty powerful of like, oh, she went to tie her shoe and she never came back up <laughs> you're seeing the final <laughs> moments of her sad life oh um, geez you are not as a gemini you are not allowed to be i'm sure there's a law banning you from controlling a gossip, gossip maybe magazine. for patreon though we could i could make like a fake gossip newsletter um i'm pretty sure that's xenon's actual newsletter and you could probably add a a section because xenon's gazette or the xenon gazette which is the patreon newsletter like could use a bit of gossip i think you and xenon would be a powerful duo i would happily do the the gossip uh... you think you should okay well there you go now if you would like to be a part of the xenon gazette and oh, you'd like to see my, my my gossip it's column, getting out of control <laughs> it's like, um it's like ask ask not ask, not dear Abby and college and at CNU. Okay. If you go to CNU right now, there, here's a fun fact. If you went to CNU at the time that I went to CNU, then you remember the very short lived under the sheets column. Ooh. Where it was a sex columnist and it was very ahead of its time. Was it you? No, but I was oh. always so jealous because the person was anonymous too. Cause I'm sure they didn't want to like get like harassed or whatever, but like, cause it's a small school. Everybody knew everybody. But it was a it was a column in our weekly newspaper where it would be like a Dear Abby where they would answer two or three X rated questions <gasps> and Fun. like only I mean that was like what I went to college like five ten years ago and uh, the world was still to me a lot different in terms of sex positivity back then. Well, you're also in Virginia. I was also in Virginia, which I do think plays a role in this. <laughs> but like the column, I remember being like, whoa, I didn't know we talk about this kind of stuff. And I remember it like getting banned, like the column had oh. to end. So anyway, maybe Xenon's going to have a sex positivity column. Also. Coming from the person who just called themselves the most vanilla person on the planet. I don't think I'm going to let you very... run the sex column. Here's the real column where you hybrid them together, where it's the vanilla person trying to give X-rated advice. Uh, now this is becoming like its own <laughs> podcast or YouTube series. That would be very fun of like me trying to explain how supportive I am without knowing any information. <laughs> You'd be <laughs> like that supportive parent where it's like, dad just shut up like I don't like I get it you don't I'm understand like, you you do you on oh, that God. on that on with all those things that you want with all to the do. sex things oh, God. <laughs> okay funny. yikes please tell me your story so I can stop talking okay good can I go pee real quick I'm sorry yes. I have to pee so bad I drink sorry, a lot of London Eva, fog how long this uh, episode is on that note tell me tell me a story tell you a tale so this is the story i've okay i'm doing this thing again where this is a story i've wanted to cover for a long time and uh this is the story of the murder of betsy faria 
and okay was <laughs> okay <laughs> there was a uh podcast that was done by nbc uh dateline and it was called the thing about pam and it was like a true crime uh podcast it was a huge deal um and i listened to it i binged it when i was back in la like a year or two ago and it's hosted by keith morrison um of dateline fame and it's so good. It's so compelling. It's fascinating. And I always knew I wanted to cover it, but it was like a six part series. And so I was like, I don't ever know how to get that down. And the storytelling was so good that I was like, I don't know how to get this down into notes. It took me a long time to finally like commit to doing the story. Here we are. It's uh, it's the story of the murder of Betsy Faria. And I also listened to a Generation Y episode on this topic and they did a really good job too. So Ooh, okay, cool. here we go. Tuesday night, December 27, 2011, Russ Faria, who lived in Troy, Missouri, went over to his friend's house for their weekly game night around 6 p.m. They watched a few movies, played a few games, and Russ left around 9 p.m. to head home. How old is he? Sorry, I know you just started this. I did not say how old he was. I am not actually even sure how old he was. Game night these Middle days aged. could really mean any age. Oh, okay. Cool. Actually, you know what? Probably, probably in his 40s. His wife was 42, so... Oh, okay, cool. He was probably, I would imagine, similar age. Um, Got it. But he and his friends have been doing this game night for years. Um, so yeah, I think probably like early to mid 40s is my guess, but uh, cool. I definitely didn't write that down. So Russ Rhea lives in Troy, Missouri, heads home around 9 p.m. When he gets home, he finds the body of his wife, 42-year-old Betsy Faria, dead on the couch. She had been stabbed over 55 times with her arms almost entirely severed from her body holy shit yeah and there was the murder weapon which was a serrated kitchen knife was found in her neck (gasps) oh my god okay and another knife was found under the couch cushions of the couch she was laying on holy shit okay so uh russ calls 911 understandably and he is freaking out they played this 911 call in the generation y episode it's like him like hysterical shrieking crying sure. screaming and um i mean says, can you imagine if that were like no <laughs> like blaze you walked in and like you just didn't have fucking arms anymore truly Jesus. it made my heart or my hair stand on end i was like listening to him and i was like i can't fathom the scene um so again big thanks to all the dispatchers out there because i can't imagine what that must be like truly um you must be good at creating a boundary bubble for yourself, which I'm not good at. I can't imagine. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like uh, like dispatcher therapists need therapists, you know? Yes, agreed. <laughs> just like a just a lot, like a chain of therapists all the way to the top. All the way to the top. Yep. <sighs> so uh, he calls 911, but on, while he's on the phone, he says, my wife has killed herself. And so the dispatcher oh. sends uh, police and ambulance, obviously, and, uh, you know, she's asking him, is she breathing? And he says, no, she's dead. She's dead. Um, there's a knife in her neck. So uh, investigators arrive. They conclude she's been dead for at least an hour, likely longer. Uh, and he had called 911 at 940. So just to give like a timeline here. Sure. Um, however, with the 55 stab wounds and a knife in her neck, they were like, we're pretty sure this is not a suicide yeah i have a hunch you can't cut your own arm off when your other arm's already off yeah okay i didn't even think about that yes that's like (laughs) probably the clearest argument of all yeah Yeah. (laughs) i think i think think. i'm pretty sure yeah so and and like with the one in the neck at the end it was just like it's just what are you talking about so you know they were they were like, that doesn't seem likely. So of course, he being the husband, he was pretty quickly uh, the prime suspect in this murder. Uh, he was arrested the day after the murder. Um, they did a diligent search of the house and in his closet, they found a pair of slippers covered in his wife, Betsy's blood. Uh-huh. So bingo, bango. Um, they also used basically what they called his volatile emotion, volatile, volatile. Yeah. emotional state <laughs> uh to to kind of pin that on him and be like he was erratic he was acting like he was too hysterical I, but i don't believe that stuff like i mean and and Me that if i walked in and you didn't have fucking arms and there was a knife in your neck and there was blood everywhere like what the fuck am i supposed to act like like 
No. Well, that's and not it's always like a lose work. lose situation because if you call and you're like, my wife has been murdered, they're like, you didn't even care. And then if you call and you like start screaming, they're like, oh, he's acting. Like there's, it's yeah, just like I mean, you're going to be analyzed no matter what. You're either, there's only a complete on switch or a complete off switch in yeah. that case, like hysterics or shock. There's, there's no in between. Yeah. And yeah. they kept saying kind of like, well, he was able to, when we interviewed him, like he was able to just kind of like turn off the hysterics and talk calm like normally and i guess I'm like, that's yeah but odd. I don't know. but like also your who knows what the fuck your brain is doing when if you're trying to preserve yourself or you're suddenly being interviewed by police and you just shut off the hysterics i don't know i just feel like it's not fair to say like this is how you're supposed to act when you're under the suspicion of your wife's murder you know because you're also thinking yeah. like well shit now i have to like defend myself I mean, my, my first thought is like, yeah, I would be a complete fucking basket case if I walked in on someone I cared about looking like that. But then you're right. Like part of me might think like you, because you're the one that found her, you're going to be one of the prime suspects. And then I would try to like play it cool while also having a fucking crisis. And like, then I look really shady. Well, And I feel like my body does that shutdown thing where I just like, I don't even react or care until later. And I like go into shock and like that's... self-preservation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or like disassociation or dissociation. Sorry. Um, anyway, so whatever. So again, you're right. I don't really believe in that either of like, it didn't seem realistic or whatever. Yeah. But... I, I, I fall for a lot of stuff, but when it comes to like how <laughs> someone's acting, when they see their loved one yeah. like, mutilated, I'd like, I, I'm out. Like, I, I don't have yeah. an opinion on that one. I do find it fascinating when they do those uh analyses of people's 911 calls and like the language they're using and if they're not using the person's name or th- like I think that's fascinating because it's like the psychology of like language and things like that I was but gonna say it- can you can you give that a shout out again because you did that really well with um the Netflix the guy who's who killed his wife and two daughters oh yeah you called it something like linguist like forensic linguistics oh yeah or I think it is for I think it is forensic linguistics and they I, I think you're right that was, it's, I remember being super intrigued by that. So just in case anyone wanted to look that up. Uh, yeah, it's so interesting. There are like websites dedicated to, um, let me look it up, Not forensic 911 calls. So there's a book called Analyzing 911 Homicide Calls. Um, I know that. Forensic audio video analysis. Yeah, so I know there's a website on it. I don't know it off the top of my head, but it is interesting. They like go through and and expert like linguist linguistic experts go through and say like, you know, she's calling about this person's her best friend's death, but she refuses to say like the name of her friend or you know things like that. And right. when uh, or she's like distancing herself in some way. Um, and I know I know with the John Benet Ramsey case, there's this whole analysis of the 911 call where uh, her mom keeps saying, "I'm the mother." but like it's just a weird phrasing you know so there's I think that's fascinating but like yeah you're right once it gets into like she's not sad enough or he's not emotional enough or he's too emotional it's like how do you even uh you know it's not a black and white thing yeah anyway so yeah so anyway that's where we begin but then they find a pair of bloodstained slippers in the closet and yeah not a good look so uh, next, police bring in Betsy's best friend, and this woman is 58-year-old Pam Hupp, and they bring her in to be questioned. So Betsy, excuse me, geez, now I'm burping. Um, Betsy, the woman who was murdered, was a mother of two. She worked in a state farm office, um, and she frequented as a part-time DJ on the side with her husband, Russ, and they owned a DJ business called Party Starters. Hey, hey, oh, raise the roof. Okay, now I'm the old dad. (laughs) That's where uh, that's where the bear and the gags. Oh, God, no. (laughs) That's where bear brings his basket of dried blueberries. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. So uh, Betsy had met Pam at work at the State Farm office. They worked in insurance together and they were close friends. Um, so they had fallen out of touch for a little while, but then Betsy was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2010. And she found out the following year that her cancer had metastasized to her liver and become terminal. And that's when her friend Pam kind of came back into her life and got involved again and started taking her to chemo and taking care of her. Right. Um, so when Betsy found out how severe her condition was, she started thinking about like leaving, uh, her husband and daughters behind and started to worry about, you know, if she died, what would that look like for her family? 
So she worried that the worst would happen, that she would pass away and that they would, her teenage daughters would, you know, not be good with the money. Russ would quote, piss it away. Like she was just worried they wouldn't take care of themselves and that the daughters wouldn't have money when they grew up. Um, So Betsy made the difficult decision of changing the name of the beneficiary of her state farm life insurance policy to her friend, Pam, and did not tell her husband that she had changed the, uh, the beneficiary from him to Pam. Got it. And she basically told Pam, you know, when, if I die, she would this, she was like, this is a timely thing. If I do pass away, then I want you to take this $150,000 and keep it in a trust for my daughters so that they are able to, you know, not quote, piss it away, like she said, and they're able to have it uh, as like a safety net growing up. So back to the day of the murder. Um, Betsy had undergone chemotherapy that day and had then gone to her mother's house. Pam drove her home from her mother's house, making her one of the last people to see her alive aside from Russ, her husband. So according to Pam, she dropped Betsy off at her house at approximately 7 p.m., which was earlier than usual because apparently Betsy was really exhausted from chemo. She wasn't feeling well and thought maybe she had a bit of a cold coming on. So when Pam was interviewed by police, she told them that Russ had a, quote, violent temper. Uh, He was a violent drinker and had actually threatened Betsy before uh, to the point that Betsy had considered leaving him, although she was too ill at this point to actually go through with it. Uh, because of the cancer and one of the stories that Pam explained which is like pretty horrifying is that I guess Russ would hold a pillow over her face as a quote game to see to try and you know I don't know to have fun apparently to like like, to like torture her to like hold a pillow to suffocate her until the last minute and uh and she would wake up apparently like suffocating on a pillow so you know she's she's saying like this is a volatile relationship this is he's a violent man uh betsy was scared of him sure um so pam told uh the police that betsy had actually been longing to move back to lake st louis which was closer to her chemo treatments and to where her friends lived and she'd actually already hatched a plan for her and russ to move into her mother's house and pam said that that evening betsy had told her that she was planning on bringing the idea up to russ she was planning on going home and saying to Russ, um, hey, I think we should move back closer to my chemo, to my mom's house. And sure. she basically told Pam uh, she was terrified because he was going to be furious that she was like bringing this up. Um, this was not something he was going to be happy about. Yeah. So yeah. Pam said she felt guilty about leaving Betsy to face her husband alone because Pam knew how violent he was. Um, and then as part of their investigation, police found Betsy's laptop. And on it, they found this sort of like diary document um, that she had left, like a a Word document. And uh, it was Betsy's kind of journal entry talking about how afraid she was of her husband. She even included a section where she described being terrified that he was going to murder her. So this is all like panning out basically as like they got the right guy. It sounds so far pretty straightforward. Yes, exactly. I mean, it it just, yeah. I can't imagine there being a twist to this currently. Yeah, it's it's pretty like open and shut case from the start, seemingly. Yeah. So on January 4th, 2012, which was the day after Betsy's funeral, Russ was charged with first degree murder and armed criminal action. And uh, he was held, he couldn't meet his bail of 250,000. So he was held in jail until his trial began nearly two years later uh, in November of wow. 2013, which okay. blows. <laughs> yeah, that does. Um, so... During Russ's trial, his defense attorney argued that the timeline just didn't add up for him to have murdered his wife because he he had the testimonies of the four friends that he had gone to game night with who all said like, no, he was with us from six to nine. Mm-hmm. And if you're saying like she was dead over an hour when he called police, like that just doesn't add up. Right. Uh, t- sorry, over an hour before he had called 911. Yeah. It just doesn't add up. Um, He also had receipts. He had made multiple purchases uh, from different gas stations and an Arby's throughout the course of the evening. And so uh, like on his way home from game night. So they were like, this just doesn't add up. Like he had receipts. He had an alibi Four different friends say he didn't do it. He was with them. It also feels though, like with receipts like that, it feels like you're trying to get an alibi. So that's part of what they argued. Yeah. Because the prosecution said, well, why would you go to two separate gas stations in one night? 
but he he argued um i this one gas station has better gas prices and this one has the cigarettes i like so he was like this is a normal thing i go to this gas station for gas and i stop at this one this one is better snacks so sue me yeah Yeah. and so and he went to arby's also so this is what the defense is saying like no look at his timeline right and then the prosecuting attorney whose name is leah askey and she comes back in the picture she countered this argument by saying well it's a little obvious and like you said, and she believed that Russ's friends were providing a false alibi and they had been in on it and had colluded with oh, him to carry okay. out the murder. So she's arguing that one friend went to Arby's to pick up uh-huh. a receipt. One friend went to the gas station, One, you know, to while he actually went home and murdered his wife. And then they all said, no, we were all playing games together. So that was the prosecution's okay. uh, defense. Didn't even think about that, but okay. Or not prosec- prosecution's argument. Yeah. Right. I had, it didn't even think that like I would have thought that like maybe the friends were like saying like no he was here when he wasn't but I wouldn't have thought like oh right. they're they're that deep in where they're getting you and they're, they're actually an involved <laughs> right <Yeah. laughs> like they actually are criminally involved in this murder yeah exactly so that's what she's arguing sure. um so on November 21st 2013 Russ Faria was convicted and on December 22nd he was sentenced to life plus 30 years in prison and sent to the Jefferson City Correctional Center wow the end just kidding i was gonna say i was like (laughs) but my fear now was like since he's already been tried wouldn't that be double jeopardy or something if he gets tried no so double jeopardy is when you uh are tried and found innocent or not guilty then you can't be tried again and found Uh guilty okay if you are found guilty you can appeal and re get a retrial and fight for your innocence but oh my gosh you're a lawyer wow <laughs> renee is like somewhere is like i don't even fucking start christine i just christine graduated and took the bar <laughs> esquire Schieffer. wow i one time joked about that and renee was like i can't joke about like titles like that i get in really big trouble i was like sorry oh yikes okay <laughs> i was like renee the attorney she's like i'm not an attorney yet please don't say that because i'm gonna get in trouble i was like okay my bad isn't esquire though like the official thing you get to put at the end if you're so i looked it up once uh- <laughs> i would literally be one of i mean it's the most gemini thing i could possibly think put of but every I would, title <laughs> i would literally become a lawyer just so i could say esquire <laughs> yeah well so esquire is apparently what you can put even if you don't pass the bar i think but you put jd i think if you have oh the, right i You're don't know right. i looked it up once because i was like i would love to put esquire but apparently that's just not a thing you do so well i didn't like, pass oh. the fucking bar can i be an esquire mm, certainly, not. I am. Okay. certainly not certainly not you could spell it wrong so i'm an esquire i i'm an esquire with a k <laughs> and a w <laughs> esquire and a heart over the i okay yeah okay so yeah double jeopardy is basically like if you're found in or if you're found not guilty you're 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 clear they can't charge you with that cr- specific crime again got it so he's sent to uh, sent to prison the end not really uh so although the prosecution had said like oh russ's four friends were in on this murder they colluded with him and they were part of this murder uh for whatever reason nobody ever brought any charges against them uh in fact the four friends hadn't even been aware that they had been accused by the prosecutor until a reporter told them later like how do you feel about uh being being uh you know named as as colluding with him on the murder of betsy faria and they were like wait what like yeah, they had no yeah. idea that was even happening in court so as Oof. much as the prosecutor said like oh they were in on it like nobody like went and filed charges against them which is a little bit odd in my opinion mm-hmm. yep um, so in January of 2014, Fox partnered with the St. Louis Post Dispatch to explore the case, and they basically wrote this expose, and they released it the following month. And the expose is where shit gets just bananas. So, Ooh. first of all, the expose revealed that the $150,000 life insurance that Pam had received had not gone into a trust for Betsy's daughters as Betsy had wanted, but had actually stayed in Pam's little pocket. Oh, oh, okay. She okay. immediately, four days after the verdict came through that Russ was guilty, she dissolved the trust immediately and took the money for herself. Not mm. a good look. Not a good look at all. No, 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 no. no. But uh, she did have a reason. She said she had been going through a really hard time. Her mom, who has suffered from dementia and arthritis, had died by suicide only three months before this expose was launched. Yikes. Um, 
and that plus the uh the loss of her close friend betsy she sort of had her reeling and she was just like scared etc okay but the expose also exposed some other interesting nuggets of information nougats okay (laughs) some nougats (laughs) uh so Investigative reports featured an interview with the 911 operator who had taken Russ Faria's call, and she stated that although the police described Russ as emotionally volatile, she believed his hysteria was fully genuine, and she was like, if anyone had asked me, I would have said, like, no, I th- I don't think he was faking it at all. Like, I listened to a lot of these phone calls, right? and I'm pretty sure what he was acting was legitimate, Yeah, um, which obviously doesn't prove anything, but it's a point in his favor. Um, so next one, which is a little more damning, the expose also claimed that prosecuting attorney Leah Askey, so the one who said like, oh, Russ's friends made up this timeline and one went to Wendy's and one, and you know, she, she was the one saying like Russ is guilty and put him in prison. So Leah Askey, the attorney had actually been in a relationship with Mike Lang, who was an investigator on the case and actually was uh, testifying in the trial. So they were like secretly in a relationship. So, you know, she wanted to win this case. There is the possibility that she said like, I want, I need you to testify and help me win this case. Obviously you'd hope that didn't happen, but they also hadn't revealed their relationship to anybody. So it's just really sketchy right. that she was dating a police officer who happened to be heavily involved with the murder case. It's just yeah, like, it's not that cute. shouldn't happen. No, it's yeah. like a conflict of interest <clears throat> times a thousand. Oh Yeah. And especially since they didn't tell anyone, it's like, well, that's extra shady, you know? Yeah, this is the time to be completely uh, upfront <laughs> yeah. about everything. Put not, your cards on the table. <laughs> this is not the time for secrets. No, not really. Um, and he actually was also the captain of investigations for the whole sheriff's office. So he had a lot of power. Oh, he had a okay. lot of information. You know, it's Yikes. sketchy. It's sketchy. Um, so two members in the jury actually found this out and went to report, went to the media and said like, Hey, nobody as the jury, we found him guilty, but nobody told us she was dating one of the witnesses and a guy involved in the case. And so they were pissed because they were like, well, we should have known that if we were, you know, trying to just determine this man's fate as right, a jury, yeah. like we want to know. So they were the ones who actually flagged this to the media. And so essentially, yeah all that but things only get even crazier because on august 16th 2016 oh my god this is just like where i'm listening to this original dateline and i'm i remember being in target and going oh i'm just like what's happening okay pam survives an attempted murder on her life okay Uh (laughs) just get ready so August 16, 2016, she's sitting in her car in the garage when a man with an armed knife accosts her, demanding she drive him to a bank to retrieve, quote, Russ's money. So luckily, she was able to knock the knife out of his hand and run into her house, but the man chased her. She grabbed her gun, which she kept on the nightstand, and shot him in self-defense. Whoa. She immediately called the police who searched his body and learned that he was one Louis Royce Gumpenberger okay i know no Mr. Comment. Burger, a resident of st charles missouri and on his person they found a note that had the following instructions handwritten on it it said kidnap hup and that's pam's last name kidnap hup get russ's money from hup at her bank and kill hup take hup back to the house get rid of her make it look like russ's wife make sure knife sticking out of neck i like how you okay someone is clearly new to the team because like <laughs> If you needed instructions of like, okay, kidnap, yeah, yeah, kill. Step oh, one. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, okay, kill, kill, yeah. Like, you couldn't remember that? Like, that's what you were fucking there to do? Yeah, and so the point of this letter was like fully clear instructions of how to kill Pam, make it look like Russ's wife, get Russ's money that he belonged to him, quote unquote. And it was Which, all for- like- all it does, all it does is like make it clear that it was like at least not the original suspect from the first murder. Like, because in my mind, I mean, you're looking at me like well, I'm crazy so the, here. Well, no, no, because no, I'm wondering because the the way they looked at it was like, well, this would be Russ giving these instructions saying like, get my money from the bank that like, I right. want you to get my money back that Pam. I'm just saying me. this, like this clearly is this person did not kill the last person because like the fact that they need a to-do list to replicate it makes it seem oh, like- Oh, no. So actually nobody ever 
thought that he he's not even um oh my gosh i don't even this know guy's this. this guy's just like in the in the mix all of a sudden they just think that this guy has been hired by russ to okay murder pam to get his money back since... so we're on the same page okay cool, cool, cool. yeah yeah so i mean that's not necessarily what they think but that's what at least this is meant to portray let's put it that way like that's the image that was meant to be created with this note and got it but it could message. but also this could have been russ or the real killer f- f- planting his own to-do list so it looked like he was a new guy on the block when he could have been the original guy is that one of the options here but- just continue just continue just continue sorry <laughs> maybe i don't know sorry, sorry. It doesn't- we're gonna find out the answers so i think am I i'm even so fucking like trying? involved in my head that i or like have read this so many times that I'm I'm just not even able to comprehend. I'm sorry. No, it's I'm sure I'm not getting my point across clearly. It's all so. But this is why I was so afraid to cover the story because it's so fucking confusing and like all of this is overlapping in different timelines. And so the way Dateline did it was so like woven into itself and like interviews. And I'm I'm just so I just I love them so much. They're so take talented. it away. I love you, Keith. Okay, <laughs> so. All of this, these instructions that this man, Gumpenberger, had apparently, this hitman basically had been given, uh, were supposed to uh, be rewarded with $10,000. That was what was written on the note. Like, for $10,000, this is what you have to do. Like, like so, a recipe list. $10,000. <laughs> one, one dash of kidnap and then two cups of kill. Knife yeah. in neck. But yeah. it's like one of those blogs where it's like the first 10 pages are like, I lived on a farm and I love uh, whipped eggs. How about you? Leave a comment below. It's like, it's okay. Like, my my favorite pastime is playing games with the boys. And, yes. <laughs> and then going to Wendy's after, clearly, but at a different gas station from my cigarettes. You know, My, my son doesn't even know it's not real beef. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know where I'm going. Um, so... The reward money was allegedly in this note, $10,000. So in his pocket, police find nine $100 bills. But things get even weirder because then they search Pam's house and uh, on her dresser, they find a $100 bill. And to make matters even eerier, the serial number matched the bills found in his pocket. (laughs) Okay. Got it. So this is yep. someone's first kill also. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. So basically she has a bill and the odds, cause she's saying I've never met this man before in my life. The odds that this man's in her house to kill her. And she happens to have a sequential bill to the ones in his pocket are so extraordinary that they were like this, the odds of this are not, this is not a coincidence that she happens to have a bill that matches his no. serial numbers. Like it's ridiculous. So something was obviously off and police were like, okay, this is getting a little fishy. So they did more research into Pam and cell phone records actually showed that Pam had been in Gumpenberger's neighborhood less than an hour before this alleged attempted kidnapping. And she was like, I've never seen this man before. I don't know who he is. She was literally like on his block uh, within an hour, which makes no sense. It wasn't like where she lived or anything like that. Um, On August 10th, 2016, Uh, a police report had been, so this is about a week earlier, a police report had been filed stating that a woman, a mysterious woman matching Pam's description had approached a local resident named Carol Alford and had posed as a Dateline NBC producer and offered her $1,000 to reenact a 911 call. (laughs) And so Hmm. this woman, they interviewed her on the Dateline episode, which they fucking ate this shit up because Dateline was like, she was pretending to be one of our reporters. Like they were just so thrilled about the fact that like, cause in the description for the podcast, it's like, and learn how Dateline got sucked into the story of the murder. Cause like fan lady- girling about their own show. Yes, being involved. Exactly. <laughs> He's like, and she thought. She okay. But to be fair, us. if someone like, I mean, and not like, I hope this doesn't happen, but like if someone were to involve reenacting and that's why we drink. I know. You know, it is very meta. It's I'm very with meta. you. I think it's like really fascinating. And so of course Dateline snaps this story up and it's like, we're going to like milk this. And they did a great job. I'm not, 
I'm saying you and I would do the same. I agree with you. Right. Um, but it's very funny because, so this woman had called police and been like, yeah, this strange lady like drove up to my trailer and said, I'll give you a thousand dollars because we're trying to reenact a 911 call. I just need you to like say this audio and then I'll give you a thousand dollars. So they had security camera footage and it showed that the woman, uh, the mysterious woman had been driving Pam's car. So they couldn't make out the person, but they saw the car and were like, well, that's Pam's car. So it's starting to fit together. Right. Did you hear that? What was that? That was the cats running down the hallway. Thank God. I thought it was something that was not alive. I thought well, it was like- <laughs> They're very much alive. Both of them just hurled their bodies into the room. They oh, chase each other a lot. It's so really sweet. obnoxious. <laughs> so oh boy. Great. If you hear that kind of sound in my room, be more afraid because <laughs> it's not I alive. <laughs> don't have animals. <clears throat> uh i'm sorry in advance mooney's doing that thing where he's like pretending he doesn't see Junie, but he's definitely like ready to pounce okay that's fine so <clears throat> they also discovered in when they were searching pam's apartment that her uh they had a swatch of carpet that appeared to have p- been positioned to protect a rug in pam's house from getting blood on it when gumpenberger was shot goodbye okay so i was like oh i don't want to ruin my nice wayfair rug in the process so okay not also not a good look but on top of all this police were like gumpenberger himself would not have probably would not have been able to commit such a crime because following a car crash in 2005 gumpenberger had actually suffered from severe mental and physical impairments which made investigators very skeptical that he would have been able to carry this out by himself and uh so they were like on top of everything else he was just working a job trying to provide for his family this seems really unreasonable that this man would get stuck in like sucked into this high stakes hit hitman situation it just doesn't fit um then investigators found that the knife that gumpenberger had allegedly used to threaten up pam had been purchased at a nearby dollar tree in pam's neighborhood alongside several other items they found in pam's house so the receipt basically had the knife and then a bunch of shit that was I don't know, like her, her new glasses. I have no idea, but her (laughs) her reading glasses, I don't know what it was, but they were all found to be from the same shopping trip at the local dollar store. Yeah. So it's not looking good. No, it's it's suddenly turning very quickly against her. So all this was so compelling that police determined Gumpenberger's innocence. Unfortunately, obviously he had been killed. Um, And on August 23rd, 2016, Pam was arrested and charged with first degree murder and armed criminal action against him. So the prosecuting attorney uh, uh, and the chief of police basically theorized that Pam had done the same thing and lured him to her home by presenting herself as Kathy, an NBC Dateline producer, and offering to pay him to reenact a 911 call. And then when he arrived, she killed him in cold blood and pretended he had threatened her and was coming after her and then planted this note. Right. But then they were like, well, why would she plant a note mentioning Russ? Like, this is a totally strange like it's suddenly like pulling back to the old case i guess so but i feel like it could i could easily explain it away Uh, to me it would make sense of like oh well you're just trying to redirect like who the original person was like it it had nothing to do with to do with me it was always ross yes so that is that is literally exactly what she was doing but at the time they were still convinced that they had put the right guy in prison because it seemed so clear cut that it wasn't until now that they were thinking wait a second like maybe we got this all wrong. So, I mean, exactly what you're saying, like, why would she write Russ on it? Well, clearly she was trying to like, she felt like things were turning a little bit toward her and she was like aggressively trying to push them back at Russ. Yes. Unfortunately doing the opposite, clearly. Um, so when she was arrested, this is a little bit horrific. Uh, she asked to visit a bathroom and then she used a ballpoint pen to stab herself in the wrists and the neck. Mm. uh but wow it was a, think of the commitment like it I, would be her yeah it's like a heinous thought if i thought i have to stab myself in in the heart wait what Hold on no, no no sorry in the wrist and the throat which throat, also is that's terrible. still terrible the, yeah the throat if, is terrible if the if the options were go to jail or stab yourself in the throat i'd be like i guess i'm going to jail i couldn't i couldn't i couldn't i would just end up like drawing on myself like it wouldn't yeah. work yeah, I would, or I would like do a test round where I just kind of like poked at it and I'd go, ow, ow. <laughs> oh my God, that was terrible. Yeah, oh, I, uh, I there's know. no way, there's no, no way. So basically, also, like, this... how, sorry, 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 sorry. No, no, also, go like, ahead. the forensics, not that I'm like, 
you know, the hot shot Olivia Benson or anything, but like, <laughs> well, none of us are. I'm, I'm pretty sure you could very quickly see, like, based on how it went into your neck, if you stabbed yourself. Like, oh, no, she wasn't trying to hide it. She was just trying to, like, get out of the, you know, how I sometimes see. when people are cornered, they do this, like, desperate move yeah. of, like, well, you can't catch me if I'm dead sort of thing. Gotcha. Okay. So the, the, the theory is that she was basically cornered and desperate and there wasn't really much sense to it except like, I'm going to take myself out before you can. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes more sense. But it didn't work because it was a plastic pen and it didn't actually really do any harm. So anyway, right. all, all that to say she tried and it didn't work. Um, so they were like, but also now, she, now they're looking at her like, why the hell did you just try to stab yourself in the throat if you're innocent? You know, exactly. it's right, not right, a right. good look. So uh, bail was set at $2 million for her. Ooh. And on December 16th of 2016, a grand jury indicted her for first degree murder and armed criminal action of Gumpenberger. But of course, now there's still the, that uh, untie that loose end of like, well, why did she do this? We need to like figure out where this came from and what it's like pointing at, basically. Right. Um, so meanwhile, Russ is still in prison for life. Um, and as this is all going on with Pam, this is what's kind of been happening on Russ's side is that his attorneys are continuing to contest his guilty sentence, saying he had nothing to do with it. Um, and then in July of 2014, Betsy's daughters, Leah and Mariah, sued Pam for their mother's money because oh. they were like, hello, that was supposed to go to us. You even said it in the trial that that was our money. And now you're yeah. just like owning it yourself. This is a this, this is of all the trials, probably I think the easiest one to just- Yeah, you'd think so. Win, right? Well, but- she had signed it over to Pam. So it was all like hearsay. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. So it's a little bit like he said, but she also, okay. I mean, we could fight about that forever. I would just be like, well, who would believe that like this woman, like just gave all the money to her own friend and not her children. But like, well, you'll see what she comes up with. Cause there is a ugh, theory. I okay. know. Cause, cause people were wondering that exact thing. Don't worry. She has an answer. Oh, so <laughs> great. she seems to have an answer to fucking everything yeah, she so. does and it's usually pretty stupid it's also always a really obviously bad answer it doesn't make any sense yeah <laughs> so they did this civil trial where the daughters are suing her for their money back for their mother's money uh and when pam was asked on trial whether betsy had mentioned that she wanted the money to be used for her daughters pam in a major turn of events said absolutely not and obviously this completely contested what she had said in the first trial of like, I did this for her. She wanted me to take this money to give to her daughters and take care of them. So anyway, on February 24th, um, Russ Faria's case was remanded in June. It was decided he would get a new trial to reassess all this information. And, uh, Luckily for lawyers on Russ's case, they received a new videotape police interview with Pam where she tried to explain why uh, Betsy had left her all this money. Okay, yeah. She told detectives that she and Betsy had been lovers. God, why are there two sets of lesbians in this? <laughs> I know. This episode is really just extra scandalously gay today. I love when you it. said it earlier, I was like, ah, but I didn't want to spoil it. Oh, I thought you were just excited that I mentioned lesbians. Oh, I like, was. <laughs> I was like, who wouldn't be? I was. I was just extra excited that I had a, a, a parallel story to bring up. Uh -huh. um, so okay. she says, neither of us were lesbians, to be clear. But trauma had made Betsy hungry for a sexual relationship with Pam. So Pam, quote, replaced what a husband would be. It was a small, small thing to give her. So uh, wait. So they were. <laughs> hang on. So wait, they were not gay but doing everything that would be defined Correct. as gay that's right okay they well were and also she said she was only doing it to like take care of her dying friend who like who, like sex like sex stuff yeah who had a terrible husband and was like wanting for fulf sexual fulfillment so she now, gave that's that to a her. good friend right there yeah right i know but that's get this a best friend okay well yeah. not quite because apparently uh -oh. one of pam's acquaintances literally snorted when they heard this saying pam <laughs> <laughs> i can't i too would have snorted in that uh, courthouse or that that room so it was like oh no no we're not gay we're just doing really gay shit and like also like we're sleeping together but we're not gay but like we sleep together but we're not gay hey, but, but i have to tell you why she snorted it's not that what wasn't you think. why what? no 
because Pam was a fucking raging homophobe. So like oh. she's literally making this up and her friend is like, that no. is even more hysterical. That's even more hysterical. So apparently this, this friend of Pam said Pam was the most homophobic, homophobic person I'd ever met. She'd say that's not normal. That's not right. Anytime somebody talks about like any sort of homosexual relations. And so the friend was like, that is bullshit. Like she would never, she's making this up as like a last ditch effort to be like, oh, we were lovers. I'm, I'm not gay, but we were lovers. And that's why Betsy wanted me to have this money. But speaking like she was of, making speaking it Speaking of up. my gossip tabloid, like this would oh. be the funniest frontline news ever. I know if like, someone wasn't like stabbed 55 times, it would have been very funny, but. It would be, it would be extra funny if the person who like snorted was very gay like who was just like yeah and that's that's rough because it literally says like her close friend and I'm like well that's rough because if you're their close friend then you and you know they're the most homophobic person ever then like you're not keeping very good friends in my mind no No, you don't love yourself honestly you're not you're you're kind of homophobic yourself I would imagine if your best friend is I feel like without even having known the context, I mean, look what happened I mean I just like hysterically laughed like (laughs) without even knowing the context if you were in that courthouse and you heard someone use that as the <laughs> I'm like I'm like I'm gay but I'm not but like I'm I mean I would have just I would have heard one person snort and I would have just <laughs> everyone would have fucking lost it I'd have been like okay <sighs> and they would have been banging the gavel like <laughs> order in the court <laughs> sorry and that was like such a small thing but like it just really tickled me I know and it's such a bummer because she really just fucking used like being gay is oh, an excuse of like it's such a it's, fucking bummer it's like it's it wasn't even terrible real. none of it was even true she just was like she was like i'm gonna even throw my own beliefs out the window and pretend to be like the most heinous thing i know which is a lesbian quote unquote to, no like, it's terrible keep but this money it's funny it is funny it's terrible yes. but it is funny it's ridiculous <laughs> because we know it's ridiculous like uh-huh. if she had really played this ruse and it had worked like that's one thing but people were like okay right. lady like you're getting like, Sit the fuck down, you yeah, straight, yeah, yeah. straight, stupid woman. Yeah. You straight, stupid woman who hates gay people. Sit yeah. down. Yeah. So anyway, the snorting happened. She said she was she was a lover of Betsy's, and that's why she deserved the money and wasn't giving it to her daughters. Um, and I can just imagine Betsy beyond the grave being like, sorry, what did that bitch just say? Like, also, we imagine the kids. The kids being like, truly. I mean, She's, yeah, all the trauma they've already gone through. And now it's like, oh, and now apparently my sick mom was having a lesbian affair with this woman who she didn't even, you're saying love, but like, but you could offer her, you could, you could serve her better than our own father, yeah, like well, or her husband, her husband. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh oh god. my God. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm not quite. Oh my God. Oh my Yuck. God. Okay. Yes. Um, husband husband but also yeah and it's you're right because it's extra icky because she's basically saying like we're not gay but like she wanted this and as a friend and she was dying and as a friend i just gave it to it's like ew don't be such yeah. a fucking and she, gross she wanted it and, and like her own husband couldn't offer this yeah you know, like, it's extra gross so it's just yeah. a real f you to the entire family structure completely to, completely. to these kids at least yeah. and the husband's like in prison for this so basically they're going back on trial and Russ's lawyers get a hold of this tape and they're like, interesting. Okay, fun twist. Um, So also, interestingly, in the original trial, this is where shit kind of fell apart, is that in the original trial, the judge hadn't allowed Russ's attorneys to present any evidence about Pam. So they, the judge didn't allow the attorneys to say, hey, Pam got the life insurance money. They didn't allow uh, them to say Pam was the last person to drive her home and see her alive because according to the judge who by the way was later uh like gotten huge trouble for quote not understanding the law uh and was actually very very um criticized for like abusing human rights so Mm. this person and was suspended and stuff like so this judge originally was like no you can't say anything against pam in russ's trial because this trial is not against pam it's against russ so there was no chance that they could point to another person and say like, Russ didn't do this. Look who has more motive. So right. the jury, all they had was Russ and they were like, well, that makes sense. He was there and he and his wife apparently argued a lot. So now finally that, the, that they're doing this retrial, there's a new judge who says like, hell yeah, please bring all this information about Pam so that we could like open this up and right. show the jury and other people like yeah russ may have had some motive but pam has like a thousand times more motive anyway so uh let's see 
Oh, it also, so the, the evidence that they were finally allowed to include also included cell phone records showing that Pam had been at the Faria house for 30 minutes after the time she had claimed to drop her off. So she said, I dropped her off and left, but now they had evidence showing that she was there for a half hour for no mm. explained reason. They also uh, had information that Pam was named the sole beneficiary of the life insurance policy that they were finally allowed to include. And uh, so remember Russ had claimed he'd been with the four friends. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the, the prosecutor said he was colluding with these friends. They were, they were part of it. Well, one of the officers timed how long his drive would have taken, 23 minutes, and found the food receipt in the back of the SUV time stamped at 9.09. So if Russ had made it home in the time lot slot and gotten food, uh, he would have had only nine minutes to stab his wife 55 times, clean up and call 911. So they were like, it's really a tight window. <laughs> like he, right. he would have had to do all this in a short window, clean up himself, shower, the oh, house. Speedy Gonzalez. Like you really yeah. have to just like. And okay. 55 times. Like that's horrendously a lot. Yeah. But the strongest evidence in the prosecutor's case, uh, so it had been that there was blood on the slippers because like, hello, mm. that's like nail in the coffin uh, for us. But if you look at the slippers, the uh, slippers had no blood on top of them. They only had blood on the sides. Uh. And so what they thought was that somebody had uh, like put blood on them and or walked through the blood and then tossed them into his closet trying to frame him basically like look he did it but if the person had been wearing the slippers it would have been not well, just was, on the bottom i was gonna say even in the beginning earlier when you mentioned the slippers like the first time around i was like is anyone really that stupid to, to put like, him in the closet yeah it's like oh let me go kill someone and then put my exact outfit right back in the let me closet clean it up, all of yeah. the blood all over it i'll like, tidy even, it yeah, yeah. absurd but, no exactly anyway. and like obviously that's such a open and shut like well his clothes were covered in blood okay he did it but like then if you look at it it's like why is there no blood on top of it just on the bottom why like didn't someone... he throw those shoes away if they already had blood also on that them? like it doesn't why, make any sense why would he put them right back in the closet where you would go look at his shit why wouldn't you put them like in a safe or under a fire or can in you the imagine ocean that in the ocean <laughs> can you imagine that feeling though when they pull the slippers out and they're like there's blood on these and put them in a bag and you're like wait what like because you didn't do it that must be yeah. the most like dooming feeling of like I didn't wear those slippers. I mean, I would, I would like to think if I got framed for a murder and someone found my bloody shoes in the closet, I'd be like, I'd like to think that I have friends who would like back me up at a yeah. police station and be like, if Em were going to kill someone, they wouldn't just fucking like, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's not even critical thinking right there. That's like, like the shoes, if I ever kill somebody, the shoes I wore will never be able to be found again. The like, fish flops will be found at the bottom of the ocean with decades their, later. With, with their original home, with their original ancestors. <laughs> They'll be with actual fish, yes. Oh, Finn and Gil. Okay. Um, so anyway, the slippers now are kind of uh, off the table because they're like well someone walked through the blood but hadn't worn them it doesn't make any sense so also regarding the fact that uh oh did i not even tell you this oh my god i totally missed this bullet russ had been brought in as well for questioning and he had failed a polygraph test oh so that i'm sorry that was like way early bullet i somehow missed that uh, but yeah so that was one of the first things that also was a nail in his coffin is like he had bloody slippers he failed his polygraph like everything yeah. was just against him well so with the polygraph apparently he later explained like i went in a room with a guy with a computer they didn't hook anything up to me uh he also had been awake for 32 hours and had smoked marijuana and so like there was so he's no not a, he's not a big thinker but like <laughs> <laughs> there's no way that like this would have been a legit polygraph because a right he was like totally out of his mind at this point and b he wasn't even hooked up. They were like making it up to try and like pressure him into to right. admitting guilt. But he's like, I didn't even like take a polygraph. Um, they just sat there and asked me questions and tried to convince me that I had failed, right. but like I wasn't even hooked up to any monitor. So that was all baloney as well. Um, so on top of this, Pam said that on the evening before Betsy's death, af after she dropped Betsy off at home, she had tried calling her multiple times because she was nervous, uh, about finding her way home from Betsy's house. 
Cause they were like, why what? do you keep calling her on when you had just dropped her off? And she said, oh, I, I just like couldn't, didn't know how to get home. And like, first of all, she'd been to Betsy's house many times. And second of all, uh, why would you go drive your friend home? Because she's sick from her chemo and needs to sleep and is getting a cold. And the first time, if you call her and she doesn't answer, you know, she's asleep and sick. Like, why are you calling her over and over again? Also, it's like 2016 or something. Like yeah. you have a phone that like, a, you have a phone that can tell you how to get home. Well, I think it's 2012. So I don't know. Did people uh, have 2011? 2011. I don't know. I didn't she have had, a, she had a Tom Tom. I had and a, that's all that she matters. had a Tom Tom. I had a Blackberry or something, but that's a different story. Um, yeah. So it was just weird because they were like, well, why are you, you just said you dropped her off because you were so worried about how sick she was call someone else or, right. you know, try and find also, your way Also, if you're home. that close, shouldn't you already know how to get home from your like, yes. friend's house? Because she had been there a week before as well. Like she had been there mel- multiple times and this didn't seem to be an issue before. So very strange. Um, things were not looking great. Uh, she apparently had originally dodged a polygraph test as well. So she'd agreed to, she had agreed to one, but then uh, she mentioned sustaining several head injuries over the year so the doc the um the police were like well can you get a doctor's clearance to uh to so he can say yes you're you're clear to take a polygraph so she wrote to her doctor and said dear dr fisher could you please write detective kaiser a letter stating that i am not able to do a polygraph due to medical reasons don't need any more details than that (laughs) so clearly instead of saying hey can you clear me for a polygraph she's like can you tell them i cannot do a polygraph right um fishy fishy yeah so obviously now the defense is pointing to pam as the one with the motive and uh russ at this point was found not guilty and was finally released from jail for a crime he did not commit um so that's good so now timelines cross we're back to how pam had shot gumpenberger in her house uh and so that was actually the month that it was announced that betsy's case was being re-examined so like you said that was the month she found out russ is getting out of prison and now they're going to be like who actually murdered her Uh uh-huh so now i need to turn the tides back and say no russ did it so i'm gonna plant this weird note in this man's pocket um also does that mean she like she um premeditated a murder just so that it would help her her storyline look right like yes. did, okay she's a bad bad lady i mean i know that she did like the whole like news lady thing but like did i did want to know if she like went into this with the intention to just murder somebody but. yeah it's pretty cold-blooded and horrific Oof. especially because like he had a lot of disabilities and she took advantage of that and you oh, know shit. it's it's all just very upsetting and like she's a cold-blooded like it's scary how how bad she is and how much she doesn't care Mm. um so anyway russ is out of jail uh pam is like desperately trying to point fingers back at russ and all of a sudden all the fingers are pointing at pam and uh so it seemed like this was just a her way of reframing russ which now wasn't working anymore Mm. so this is not all though, because like I said, Pam is a cold blooded biatch. So in 2016, after Pam was charged with the murder of Gumpenberger, uh, the police department also reopened uh, the case of the death of Pam's mom, who <gasps> had died by suicide, right. quote unquote, on October 31st. So Shirley Newman is Pam's mom. And uh, Shirley's son, Michael, had said, like, no, I believe uh, her death was accidental. Um, or she had died by suicide but uh after pam had murdered gumpenberger and was now another suspect in betsy's case everybody was kind of like maybe we should reassess the yeah. other death that happened a lot of death happening around this one around this lady yeah she's the center of it uh so to break down what happened uh to Pam's mom. So on the evening of October 30th, Shirley Newman, Pam's mom was driven home by Pam following a hospital visit, which already sounds familiar to Betsy's story Mm -hmm. at approximately five, Pam dropped her off at her apartment and then instructed the staff of the, the facility or whatever, not to expect her for dinner that evening or breakfast the following day. Okay. And by the way, nobody, then the next day when she was dead, nobody was like, that's odd. No, because it just didn't. So wild. I know. 
I don't know. I don't know. It's really I weird. feel like I feel like I, someone should have reported that of like, oh well, that's weird that it was she told imp- yeah implied we shouldn't expect she her. wouldn't be around. Yeah, yeah. I, it's very sketchy. Hmm. So on October 31st, unfortunately, a housekeeper found Shirley Newman dead beneath the balcony of her home. So she had fallen through the aluminum railing of her balcony, like not over it, but through the bars. And like, you can see it, there's like bars busted out of it. Um, And if they did a a medical examination, it uh, concluded that she had died from blunt trauma to the chest from a fall, but the autopsy showed that she had eight times the normal dose of Ambien in her system. Well, okay. So this is why they thought it was a suicide because they were like, well, she nobody OD. accidentally takes eight right. Ambien. If you forget, you'd take another one, you know, whatever. But eight in a row is a lot. Um, yeah. So they were like, well, that that's why it was initially called a suicide. And her son even said like, yeah, I think that this was something she took too much medication and was in a trance or a state and fell. But Oof. like, weirdly enough, this railing apparently was so, it was like nearly impossible to bust through. You need, I think like, I don't 400 pounds of force or there's like something that they studied it. Uh, they talked about it in generation Y, but like you need like so much force to be, you, you don't just like fall and bust out these railings. And I've never, mean? yeah. And I've never been like an ambient person, but like, I imagine you're a real zombie. Like you're not yeah. throwing a lot of force into something. If you don't have to, you're right, just right. And like like falling is one thing, but yeah, exactly. But it's not like you get like super strength and can bust through the railing. And then you would have had to bust through the railing and then like slid through it and fallen. Uh You know what I mean? Like it's very odd. Yeah. It's a very odd thing that they hadn't really considered before. Um, Pam was also the last person to see her alive. Also sounds familiar to Betsy's story. Yep. And so from the death of her mother, Pam and her siblings each received approximately $120,000 of investments and they shared a $10,000 life insurance payout. But earlier that year, um, prior to her mom dying, Pam had been videotaped. This is really eerie saying, basically, uh, she said, Hey, if I wanted money when she was trying to defend herself about Betsy, she said, Hey, if I wanted money, my mom's worth half a million dollars and I would get all of it if she died. So it'd be a lot easier for me to go for her than go for uh, Betsy. And it's like, okay, ugh, why would you say that a and B yeah. like, she wasn't even worth half a million. It was a lie. It's just so sketchy. I don't know if she thought that she was worth half a million, but she was worth $10,000 in life insurance. So I don't know. She was apparently worth something. She yeah. I guess something, something yeah. that, that Pam really wanted. So Yikes. Um, so the police, uh, reopened their investigation. They interviewed the housekeeper who found the body. Um, and they then concluded again that the death was accidental, but in November of 2017, the chief medical examiner changed the manner of death from accidental to undetermined. Ooh. And I think that's a pretty rare thing to like change the manner of death so long after I'm not positive about that, but in her notes, she stated since her death, many things have happened that involved the daughter. And so all of that investigation, including the one in Lincoln County and the one in St. Charles became pertinent information. I was no longer willing to say it could be an accident. So Mm. The medical examiner's like, nope, changed my mind. There's no way this was a fucking accident. Um, Interesting. Yes. So in 2018, during Pam's trial for the murder of Gumpenberger, the judge ruled that uh, prosecutors couldn't present evidence relating to Shirley's death, but they could re- present evidence related to Betsy's murder. So okay. there's all these murders going on. She's on trial for Gumpenberger's murder specifically. Uh, she entered an Alford plea, uh, which I don't, I, I've mentioned this a few times on the show, but it's, it's hard to remember, but basically an Alford guilty plea is where you admit that you say, I didn't do it. I'm maintaining my uh, innocence, but I believe that if a jury saw all this evidence, they would call me guilty. So I'm going to put in a guilty plea, but I'm so to avoid the trial, I'm going to put in a guilty plea to avoid a jury trial, but I'm maintaining my innocence. Got it. It's like, so, I'm aware how shady this looks, but yes. to save my own skin, I'm going to plead guilty. It's like a technicality almost. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to plead guilty, but I'm putting in the record that I did not do this. Right. So um, as a condition of this deal, uh, Pam didn't face the death penalty. She was sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole. She's currently serving her sentence at the Chillicothe Correctional Center in Chillicothe, Missouri. 
And in a phone call to her husband, Pam claimed she had pled guilty so her family wouldn't have to witness an ugly trial. So Aww. she's still maintaining that she's fully innocent and did this for her family, which like, yeah, okay, heard that before, lady. Yeah, for real. Um, so in piecing all this together, basically her motive for everything she did was money. Um, she worked in the life insurance industry, like I had said, and she had actually been fired twice for forging signatures. So she had already <laughs> been God, fucking- this- come on now like yeah. why, why on earth are you even trying to kid anyone i mean it's that's ridiculous a, i know we have to like we can't just straight up say someone <laughs> did something but i can, i personally don't see another way no no and i mean i think it's pretty much assumed that she did it um also like who's hiring her after being fired twice for forging co- signatures in a life insurance in- place yeah, that seems really job. sketchy yeah <laughs> So she had also collected money for a family impacted by cancer. And when she was um, kind of looked at for Betsy's death, she said, uh-huh. uh, like, A, I, like my mom has a higher life insurance policy. It'd be a lot easier to, for me to get it that way. And B, if I were so desperate for money, I actually raised $50,000 for this woman who it was her last Christmas because she had cancer and I raised $50,000 for her family, yada, yada. Well, later they mm-hmm. fucking looked into this. She did raise $50,000 and she didn't give it to them. She kept it. And the family said, the family whose mother did die after her last Christmas said, we've never heard about this. Like she was using their family as like uh, a fundraiser and saying like, oh, we just need to help her through her last year of life. And she has a family to support. And then she fucking kept the money. It's just ridiculous. The second you even said it, I was like, that yeah, you, you looked there. really sad. You were like, oh, no, that's like, terrible. Can you just stop saying <laughs> this. Stop. Just stop. Don't even finish the sentence. I already know what's like, fucking. Wow, coming. you sound all of like our all of our iTunes reviewers. Can you just stop <laughs> talking, please, for once? Also, oh, every God. single nasty reviewer, people are like, "M just interrupts Christina all the time." Uh, I had ADHD. Dennis. How dare you attack? Do people say that? Oh, everyone thinks that I'm just like the most annoying when it comes to interrupting you. I was like, I needed medicine. What? Excuse me. So, and I, unmedicated. How dare you challenge I'm, them? No, I'll, if if when it comes to, I mean, I haven't looked at the reviews in a long time, but me neither. And we don't get too many nasty reviews, but I would say ninety percent of the nasty reviews we have are because I won't shut. That up. hurts my feelings. Oh, don't say that about my M. Feelings. <laughs> yeah, don't fucking say that about M. I only read the ones that said I was like a dumb valley girl. So whatever, but um. Hey, I meant to say this actually in this episode, fittingly enough, but if you guys can write us a review on iTunes, it's super helpful. <laughs> well, we haven't asked for one in ages. Oh, that's and I, true. You're I feel right. like most podcasts are like rate and review and we never say it. So um, if you have a minute, can you just say, I love when M interrupts Christine. It's great. It's my favorite thing. Or be like, I love that M is now medicated and therefore there's no more interruptions. So for all the people who had something to say, come back and Even listen again. Even though M said that the medication wasn't working, but- it's working a little bit. It's <laughs> not, it's, it's really not working the way I want it to though, which is such a shame. I really wanted like to be laser focused on shit. And like, now I'm, I'm still too distracted for me to be saying that this is a successful medicine. So hmm. all right. anyway, well, but yes, please write and review and maybe uh, make those, those mean reviews. Disappear. It does. It does make me feel better. Cause sometimes if I like check our, uh, podcast page just to like see if something uploaded and I scroll down like the featured reviews a one star and it just like my heart crumbles into a million pieces because it's like I used to like this show and now they suck and I'm like okay that really hurts my feelings anyway I I'm think, just a big baby I mean we're both babies but yes. <laughs> I uh no it does make me really happy though because there there really weren't too many mean reviews but the in between them, there were so many nice ones. So I was I know, like, I know, really jazzed. So it's, thank you to all the people who do say nice things. The wonderful reviews are so, out. yes, so heartwarming and like affirming and wonderful. Um, and I know we did have some rough patches with touring, so it always kind of stings. I always it stings. I always feel bad when people are like, Af- after they started touring, I couldn't listen to them anymore. And it's like, we couldn't listen to each other. No, either. I know. Like it was, we, we fixed get it. it though. We fixed it. And nobody I think we did. I moved across the country to fix it. 
I left M. <laughs> I said bye. <laughs> no, I think I definitely think we fixed it after that first tour. We just didn't know what we were doing. I mean, we were out would? of our element. Yeah, we were. Imagine completely... all of a sudden someone says, "Hey, people really like you," and now you have to completely flip your world upside down, and you have you have no precedent for this. No, and, and all just, of a sudden we all were the so overwhelmed. On, but it's yeah. also your fault because you agreed to this. Like you can't, you know. It, it, we know that it was like a rough time. And so we yeah. really tried to get things. I think we did. Yeah. Especially with, I mean, we, I, I would say, I mean, people are probably already turning off the episode, but <laughs> I, wait, there's more. Don't leave yet. Okay. But sorry, while we're basically FaceTiming, uh, <laughs> we really did nail it. Like, I mean, granted, like the, the pandemic hit, but in our first like chunk of here for the booze, like we fucking figured we it out. So, we nailed we, it. We got the formula. We were like, this is how we can re- retain our sanity, limit our, yeah our uh breakdowns yeah it was and do it a good was, show i was really proud of us it was such a it's really is such a shame we say so often that the show was so fucking good and i would say anyone who actually had i got to come to the here for the booze show would say it was a fucking amazing show i hope but so. on, on top of that it was the behind the scenes finagling we did to make sure that like like the our actual podcast itself also stayed really yes good. it was like upfront work that Ooh. we did to make sure that during the tour we had it easy enough to make this our priority like the regular episodes a priority basically if you listen to other podcasts after this and they end up blowing up and doing really well that they start touring if during their first tour they sound real (laughs) fucking exhausted give give them a goddamn break and like and just power through because they're going to figure it out like it's it's so worth it so yeah and we and like we recognized it like it was hard it was really hard because everybody was pointing it out and we were like we're trying to fix it and I'm not (laughs) complaining in a way of like this wasn't our fault like it was because we agreed to it but we learned pretty quickly like how to fix it anyway sorry this is like a 10 minute rant about us trying to I don't know defend we ourselves. love you and we appreciate everyone who stuck with us God, and like, I do too when people say I've been listening since the beginning it makes my heart like swell because I'm I like know. that means they got through a rough patch <laughs> they really did I and we appreciate it. so if you know anybody who ever says like oh I, I used yeah. to listen but I couldn't get through a certain patch just say like they figure it out it's they good. It's say that you haven't met xenon you yeah. haven't met Xenon. Do you even know who Lemon is? No. Do you even know? Stay. No. Okay. Sorry. I promise that we're getting here. The uh, okay. <laughs> anyway, I love you all. If you could leave a review, it's super helpful. You don't have to. I don't, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it is helpful. Um, because sometimes I really hate seeing those one stars and maybe I should just talk to my therapist. Really anyway. the co-host of a one star review. I know show? Okay. it's painful. It's like one day you should meta. do one day you should like really fuck yourself up and like do a beach to Sandy episode on. And that's why we and, drink. <laughs> oh, I hadn't thought of that. Most people suggest, do you know that sometimes to beach to Sandy, we like really are self-sabotaging because people send one star reviews of ourselves to us and say, isn't this funny? And it'll be like, Alexander and Christine are like the most blah, blah, blah. And they're not funny. And they just want to hear themselves. T- like, I mean, just like really cool you, stuff. And they send it to us and go, isn't this hilarious? And I'm like, no, it's just mean. <laughs> also, but like you guys kind of found the perfect formula because like now when people give you one star reviews, you can roll it off your shoulder a lot faster. It's but pretty- does it, does it keep you at the bottom of, of like, no we podcasts? said like we we've said like we do not appreciate one star reviews like oh, okay <laughs> we make a point also in the show to like highlight five star views of companies and stuff to be like hey people who leave one stars are assholes and are ridiculous so basically nobody wants to be a one starer if that right. makes sense yeah. anyway okay sorry uh yikes everyone just go away I'm just turn so this off sorry no i want to finish my story please um uh, okay, people already stop listening after your story i want people to stay okay so uh she still maintains her innocence in prison so her motive was money wh- whether it was her mother whether it was this gumpenberger guy whether it was uh this family that she duped for $50,000 who had cancer, which is just so sick. Um, so this neatly segues, oh, I mean segues, uh, into <laughs> how Russ Faria, a wrongfully imprisoned man, seemed to have a little bit of justice, at least in 2020, in that the Eastern Missouri Sheriff Department reached a $2 million settlement with him. So at least oh. he got a payout eventually, uh, which obviously does not ever make up for being All wrongfully imprisoned. Yeah. yeah. But it's something to help him restart his life. He's also like lost his job, his reputation, all of that. He says he can't rebuild. So it's mm. it's really rough. Um, 
And since Pam was only convicted of killing Gumpenberger, uh, the case of Betsy Freya's murder is technically still open, even though we kind of all know who did it. Um, yeah. And to think she stabbed her 55 times. It's just so fucked up. Anyway. Um, and Pam's mother's death is also still undetermined. Um, and wow. Vox says on the web- their website, quote, it's also important to know that this is a story that's still ongoing. Following Russ Freya's overturned conviction and eventual acquittal in a second 2015 trial, his wife's murder is now still technically unsolved. The current prosecutor is trying to change this and new documents and information about the case are still being released. So it might come to terms that she is uh, finally convicted of Betsy's murder, which I think would be a nice piece of justice for the family. Right. Um, so you can listen to The Thing About Pam, which is an excellent, excellent podcast, like so well done and researched the interviews. They talked to the woman who said uh, that like Pam pretended to be Kathy, a Dateline reporter. So it's all very in-depth and interesting. Um, Generation Y also did a good job. And I want to leave on something a little bit uh, positive, but also sad, which is um, just <laughs> <laughs> just like the the final note on the the victims in this case. So Betsy Faria uh, died on December 27, 2011. She's survived by her two daughters and husband and is remembered by Russ, especially by her outgoing personality. Shirley Newman died on October 30th, 2013 and is remembered to be a loving mother and grandmother. And Louis Gumpenberger died August 16th, 2016. He is survived by his family, including his son and daughter. His ex-girlfriend, Shannon, remembers how he always wanted to make everyone laugh. And that is the story of The Thing About Pam is wow. that she's a terrible person yeah the one thing that's most important about pam is to stay the fuck away from her yeah please uh, oh my god do not come near her yikes wow well thank you i appreciate you. your story uh everyone please go write and review us after <laughs> the chaos that is this podcast yikes i hope people don't give us a one star like they're just begging for attention i'm like oh I don't someone know will ask. someone will but someone else will refute it so we're good. i hope so we just um, love you guys and we want to keep doing this because you're just i don't know especially so after fun. four years i think we have a, like a slight fear in the back of our minds of like oh my gosh are we old now are they getting bored of us yeah we're but, gemini uh, so we always want to keep things like Spicy. <laughs> yes, spicy. That's why we're starting a gossip mag. Go to uh, bit.ly. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Go to uh, M's tabloids, uh, <laughs> M's gems, if you will. Oh, um, we'll work on that. Well, we'll shop it. Um, but anyway, thank you guys so much. Uh, you can find everything at and that's why we drink.com, can't you? You sure can. And our socials are the M Schultz and X Teen Chiefer. And you can find us at ATWWD Podcast. Yes, and Eva's social is ew gross with three, with three S's. W's. No. Three W's. Oh. Look up Eva through our social. I don't know. Okay. Just type in ew G and then wait. No, is it three S's? You're probably is right. Three, I, I think it's last three week W's I said now. three W's. Okay, well we'll find out. Eva. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Uh, maybe just goodbye. <laughs> she's in there. She, she's in there. You'll find her here. I'll and you. Oh. oh, you're right. It's three S's. My dumb ass said three W's and Eva didn't even correct me last week because she's too nice. I'm sorry. It's three S's, not three W's. Okay. Ew, gross. And that's why we drink. drink. <laughs>